Welcome to my world Won't you come on in Peter. All right, everyone, away we go here on a Wednesday. It's hump day, everyone. Good morning, Manchester. Yes, we are here. It's the morning show coming at you live at 95.3 FM WMNH. All right, starting out at 69 degrees this morning. It looks like we're going to have some storms a little bit later today. So keep your eyes to the sky. We got a great show for you today, everyone. Mr. Nick LaValle will be dropping by to talk about his Laugh for Life event that he will be performing at Friday at the Alpine Club. We'll talk about that a little bit. We have our first presidential candidate calling in uh, right after 8 o'clock tomorrow. U.S. Congressman Seth Moulton will be calling in. He's a congressman from Massachusetts. So we're excited about that. All right, Daryl Dion should be here, should be on his way. We got Matt Cushane uh, coming in today. So all that is going on. So get ready, everyone. As usual, phone lines are open, 250-6007. And our Facebook live room is lighting up. Good morning to our friend Don T. Tibbetts. Happy hump day. Yahoo. All right, Amy Hazard King up early. Uh, first one in there almost every morning. Good morning and uh, happy Wednesday to you, Amy. So very, very uh, excited. But she's having a hard time waking up, as we all do. It's the middle of the week. You know what? Yesterday was, speaking of, you know, this is a, you know, summertime is hard. It's hard to get up and get going and everything. But I'll tell you, yesterday was the last day the sun set after 8 o'clock. Today it sets at 7.59. And by the end of the month, this will make you really feel good. By the end of the month, we lose about a half hour of daylight. Because the sun will be setting at uh, 7.30. So uh, as we slowly transition into uh, the next season, I don't know if I'm looking forward to it. I like, I, I like the summer, but I also like the, uh, the autumn. So very exciting. Very exciting. So Dawn Marie, good morning. And she says, good morning, Manchester. So yes, Jan Bopalon, good morning to you. Very nice. Very nice. And uh, as Daryl Dion gets uh, settled in, very good. We're, we're, we're waiting for you, Daryl. We're waiting. We can't wait. Your fans are waiting for you. <laughs> I have fans? <laughs> yeah, I think you may. I oh. think you may. Very good to see you. How you doing? All right. Catch, your, catch your breath. Catch, catch your breath. You're, it's the, you're like the one-armed guy. I from, am the one-armed guy. Right. <laughs> What's that show? What's the one-arm uh, that was the fugitive? Right. 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 Although, I'm Although you really have... Oh, no, you're not a fugitive. And you actually have two arms... One just doesn't work so great right now. <laughs> One, the the uh, the right arm is actually getting better. Really? Yeah, I got more mobility this morning. Wow! I realize I'm able to get from my right to almost my left underarm, which is way better than anything that's recently. Right, right, very good. And uh, you you saw your friend Dick this morning. I've got the uh, morning cleanup. All right, <laughs> all right, very good. That's all right. That's it's a all wake right. up call. Right, awesome. He's, he's going to get you someday. Something's <laughs> going to happen where he, you're going to have to go over and help him. I'm up for that. Yeah, you would. Absolutely. Right. That's what best friends do. Mm -hmm. No matter what. Right? 
No matter what. No matter what. Uh, there's always that. I mean, you know, you're really lucky if you do have a friend like that. Where almost like a brother. It's almost like a brotherly love. He's my brother, brother from another mother, most definitely, and, and, and always has been. From the moment we met 40 years ago up until this very moment. It's 40 years ago. So you you met him when you were 30 years old, just about? Yeah. Okay. Wow. How'd you, go, how'd you guys end up meeting? He worked with uh, another very close friend at an insurance agency. Okay. And <clears throat> um, and the, the first time I actually met him, he was the guy that played Santa Claus during the Christmas season. Oh, okay. So my f- other friend uh, brought him over and... Um, he came in dressed as Santa Claus, and I didn't. I I, I didn't know who he was. Well, yeah. I I had met him, but just you know casually. So sure. I'm looking at this guy, and this guy dressed up as Santa, and he looked really, really good. Really, I mean, like he, a real deal. Absolutely. So he's trying to bust in my house, and I don't I don't recognize this guy. Now, do you have a chimney? <laughs> oh, he came through the side door. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what I used to ask my mom as a kid because we lived in an apartment building, and so you know back when I believed you know back when Santa Claus was. Uh, you know, coming to bring presents and everything. I'm like, how does Santa Claus get in our house? We don't have a chimney. <laughs> well, you know, he has a key. He has, he, a has key. A, he has a key to everyone's house. I like that answer. Right. Okay. So I bought, he, and, I, and I bought it. <laughs> so go ahead. So he, so he, come, and I won't let him in the house. So it took my other friend to come in and uh, tell me that this is Dick. Uh, it's cool. And, uh, yeah, don't worry. He he doesn't dress as Santa all the time. But it's I'm not the guy to let somebody I uh, that I don't know in the house. Sure, never. you don't, you never know. Absolutely. So from that point on, we are best of friends. Oh, that's <laughs> great. That's great. I've also had a friend for almost forty years. It's a long time. Right. Well, let's see. Oh, well, since I'm, grammar school? Well, I'm not saying forty. I'm gonna we'll go thirty five years. Okay. Thirty five years. Uh, my friend John Manning. Oh, okay. Who we met when we were uh, just young kids. Were you, was he your best man? Uh, no, he actually wasn't my best man. When I, I don't know, he had some other stuff going on back back when I got married. You mean back in the nineties? That's what it would be. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, Daryl, I was John's best man. Ah, oh, right. And I was, was that John, the infamous? Uh... Yes, yes. It was, it, <laughs> I it was last summer. John, name. John is coming up on his first anniversary. Wow. So uh, that's great. But... So he was a long time holdout. Yeah, yeah, but that's married. okay. But some some people do that, you know. They get it all, everything they need to do out of their system, and then settle down. And you know what? And doing wonderful, the, by the way. Great. And you know what? You have an opportunity to grow up. Well, I don't know if we've grown up. <laughs> I, I, I always feel like. Do you, do you do you always feel like that through your whole life? You have that little side of you that like still kind of uh, kid like. Not now. Okay, not now. Not now. Right. Okay. Because I still do. I don't know why. You're I, allowed. Oh, I am right. Absolutely. And 40, uh, pre 50. And 40, pre 50. But after 50, it's all over. Well, you you might have to straighten out a little bit. Straighten out a little. Yeah. <laughs> just so, a little. So, well, I have a, a whole, I have a whole year in one month. Absolutely. Just about. So go crazy. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I get your endorsement. Absolutely. Anyway, I was just telling the audience, uh, we're going to have candidate for, uh, president of the United States, uh, calling in today. It is, uh, Seth Moulton, a, uh, Democrat from the eighth congr- uh, congressional district down in Massachusetts. And he'll be calling in today. And all right, finally the intern comes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Matt, you're getting way too much abuse, man. Way too much. And I, you know what? I look forward to Matt coming on the program here uh, every week. Absolutely, I, get a coffee. Well, that's why I look forward to him coming in every week. <laughs> I called. I said, should I get Daryl a coffee? He said. No, Daryl is not important. Who's the star of the show? Whoa. whoa. And I was actually here at 6.30. Wait a second. Wait a second. I didn't put enough sugar in his coffee. He dumped it on my head, so I had to (laughs) run home, take a shower. So there's a lot of stuff you're not seeing behind the scenes here with this guy. So you're saying you took a shower? I had to. Right. Now, how long does it take you to blow dry your hair? Uh, A little while. A little while. (laughs) Do you you use a blow dryer or do you air dry it? I'm actually uh, getting ready. I'm doing a character for, for a promo video, so... Really? Yeah, oh, caveman. Cool. So easy a caveman can do it. All right. I like that. Yeah. I so dig easy it. a caveman can do it. Sounds yeah. like a Geico thing. Yeah, it is a Geico thing. It's a complete spin on it. All right. Yeah. All right. When can we look well, forward to that? We're very that? innovative, you know, in the whole program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Let's say good morning to Heidi Hamer in the Facebook Live room. Uh, Shannon McGuire. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Everyone's in there, man. 
Cool. And I think they just get in there because now the people that show up in the Facebook live room every day, now they're fighting for top fan. <laughs> yeah. Because on Facebook, you get top fan. And you didn't even do that, right? That just happened? Yeah, that just happens. I've been waiting to see your name up there, but I, I, I don't uh, I don't see it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like to I don't like to watch like do you ever watch the shows? Uh, no. No yeah, no, no. I don't and, and sometimes only in passing, like if I'm flipping around the radio and I'm out, I, I, I will hear uh, the replay. Yeah. And I always when I hear the replay in the afternoon sometimes, I forget sometimes some of the stuff that we have talked about. There's a lot of stuff going on. There and is. it's two hours is a lot longer than you think. It does go by quick, you but like covers a lot of ground. There's just a lot of stuff, right? You're saying exactly. Oh yeah. So what's going on with you, Matt? <sighs> Not too much. Just getting ready for uh, September, you know. And it's a brand new school year coming up. Brand, on us. brand new school year with Boy, the kids. Screaming, um, screaming, right around the corner. Yeah. When when does school start? Because we had some controversy last oh, year. Heard September fourth. Yeah, I think some. I, honestly, I right. don't know. We better not say anything because we'll get calls from the school department saying no. Absolutely. It's, <laughs> it happened last year. I know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to it again. I want to mention that Nick LaValle will be here this morning. And, of course, uh, oh, cool. Congressman uh, Seth Moulton from Massachusetts uh, will be calling in. He's running for president. He was not on the uh, debate stage with all the other uh, uh, candidates. We can ask him that. But uh, uh, this guy is a, a, a true, you know, I, I looked at his bio uh, a Marine, uh, served in Iraq, a couple tours in Iraq. So, uh, anxious to hear his story. It'd be interesting to find out how he's moving on from not being able to debate. Right. I wonder how that, now, now how does that work to get up on that debate stage? You have to achieve certain numbers. Right. Or get some, get some, uh, uh signatures. I think I'm not positive. It might even it. be invite. Well, well maybe it's an invite. I think right, you, you have, you have to sustain certain numbers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think Andrew Yang and Another candidate were right on the bubble to get to get in the top ten. Yeah, and they may be in fact in it by now. Okay, but it's going to be ten now instead of twenty. Well, no, haven't we already had the debates? Oh, there's more. Oh, I know there's more coming up, but it ha it hasn't after this last uh, two night debate because there's so many candidates. Has anyone dropped out yet? There's just all those candidates still. Uh, that uh, no. Uh, because they haven't made, met the criteria for the next debate. Okay. So, you know, when you're not on the debate stage, you got a long road to hoe. Okay. I mean, really, you know? Oh, yeah. So you don't get the FaceTime. I mean, you it's don't almost get to spread your message. What is it, 20? 20? It candidate? was 20. 20, right? Now it's going wow. to be down to, at, at best 10. Okay. Okay. And the uh, top 10. The top 10, right? <laughs> so do we know when the but, next debate is? I think September. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was going to ask a question like, is this something you're really getting involved in now, or have you always been involved with politics? And not to say I'm a lot of people watching. You the asking Daryl, or you asking me? I'm not asking you. I know the answer <laughs> to you. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Huh? I've, I've never been involved, ever. Yeah. And I'm on the periphery. I'm not. I'm not in it. I'm just paying more. No, attention No, that's this what I'm time. saying. Paying yeah. attention. Paying that's all attention I'm talking about. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Through through my years, uh, I mean, I always voted. Uh, uh, typically, not paying enough attention. Yeah. But I'm definitely paying more attention. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, I was kicking myself all day yesterday because I got I got the uh, I got the memo that uh, Seth uh, Representative Seth Moulton was uh, calling in today, and he was uh, he was endorsed already by four star General Stanley McChrystal. But I read this thing real quick, and I said Stanley McChrystal was calling in, and I, and I sat there all day yesterday thinking, why is a four star general calling the morning <laughs> show <laughs> for recruitment purposes? Right, and and, and this guy ran the the. the uh, you know, part of the, the, the troops in the Iraq war, uh, Stanley McChrystal, but he has uh, endorsed uh, Seth Moulton for uh, president, which is very important. Absolutely. So, but I, 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 I apologize you know. because, I mean, you know, like Matt, you know, we were kind of joking. Well, I don't know if he was joking around, but <laughs> I, I, I am so, you know, there's just so many candidates and stuff. It's hard to keep up. And I, I guess I just kind of wait till it's whittled down and we have, you, you kind of get lost. Right. There's so many. Well, right, because the primary isn't coming up at uh, the end of this year, right? It's yeah, got a no, it's year. in January. The primary will be in January this year, the New Hampshire primary. The election is next year, 2020. 2020, correct. Right. So the primary's in the, January. The primary's in January. Mm. And by the way, See, that's, I didn't know that. we, will be, Nor did I. we will be there on Radio Row live during all the festivities over at the Doubletree Hotel. Wow. So what I think we're going to do as it gets a little bit closer, but it's going to be uh, uh, your two favorites, Matt Connerton and myself, will be handling all the... Uh, Have you done this before? Yeah, Believe it or not, the when we started the radio, when, when, when we got on the radio, Joel and I, before we even had the morning show, we that was our first gig. 
cut it out. Oh, it was cool. great. Two guys going in, not knowing anything. <laughs> First show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it wasn't even the morning show. It was just That's a hilarious. WMNH special. We had the, uh, we, you know, we got our own little desk there, and we were with, which was, which was pretty cool for me because, you know, uh, a lot of other broadcasters Some were heavy there. hitters. Uh, yeah, VB from, do uh, you know VB from uh, Fox, uh, Fox News Boston? Uh, he used to, and he used to be the, uh, who's, who's the, uh, I can't, geez, uh, what's his name? Talk show, uh, talk, sh radio talk, Boston, older guy. Uh, yeah, big Whitey Bulger thing. Remember him and what, what, what I can't think of his name. I Somebody help that. me. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. He's either. a conservative, uh, local, but famous though. Oh. Uh, what's his, what's his name? He, he, mm, somebody help me. See, I was, I, I've never been in it. This is the only time I'm kind of paying attention. So back three years ago. Or four years ago, I, I would never know that. Right. <clears throat> Maybe get some help. That's what Facebook. I was kind of getting at. Like, do you think it's the time you have more time now, or are you just more involved? Are you seeing how important it really is, or what? Oh, well, all of the above. Yeah, I definitely have more time. Right. And you know, uh, Ben's politically involved. Yeah. And which piqued my interest as well. So I think, uh, and that's pretty much why. So is anyone here going to the big Trump rally next Thursday? No, I am not. No, well, I, I I'm not going either. It should be chaotic downtown. Some people though. are getting texts on their phone saying, uh, click here to get your free tickets. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> so it should be an interesting, uh, next because next Thursday ne next Thursday is going to be crazy on downtown Elm Street. You get the president coming over at the uh, SNHU uh, Arena. Then you also have the Woodstock concert in uh, Veterans Park, part of the in-town Manchester Summerfest. That same night? That same night. Wow. So there's going to be a ton of stuff going on uh, right down around there. Yeah, I was talking to Ben about parking. We're definitely going to be parking on Chestnut. Oh, really? We're not going to be parking down. Uh, yeah, it's in the summertime, crazy. though, a nice little walk. I mean, I, I, I look forward to it. I, I don't actually have a do with that. park in those places often yeah. on purpose just because so I like from walking. the maddening crowd. Yeah. And it's, easy, <laughs> and, and it's easy in, easy out. Right, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And then don't forget uh, tomorrow, uh, another traffic alert down here on Elm Street is the uh, Cigna 5K annual That's a Cigna. big deal. Yeah, so I think it's, is it the oldest, like, 5K? I think you're right. I would say in Manchester, for sure. Been going on for years. Yeah. It, years. It, it always, I, I may have run in that in the 70s, but I'm not positive. Oh, okay. In you, terms of the, really? Uh, if it was a Cigna, I know I ran a... a Were you running the right way, or what? <laughs> I was running the right way. <laughs> this is back I in do the, the race in, opposite, in the just that. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was running five miles a day, and actually I had Kathy, my uh, future bride, uh, time me. And I was running six minute miles, which is, you know, That's in the good. grand scheme of things, good, it was okay. Good enough, absolutely. Okay. So I finished the race, thank God, in the middle of the pack, I think. But it was fun. I don't know if it was a Cigna, though. I can't uh, say, swear to that. All right, let's say good morning to uh, John Manning in the Facebook Live. Yeah, I know that. Dude. All right. Yes, John, yes. All I right, let's dude. say good morning to Matt Connerton and the very beautiful Abigail White is in there this morning. Oh, she very says, good. good morning, guys. And gays. <laughs> That's what is it that, says. Is that talking to me or what? I don't know. Th well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What's a gays? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe she meant gals. Yeah, maybe it was maybe, a typo. Yeah. But, but it, she could just say gays. Yeah. Guess Who knows? Could be gays. Uh, the, the person I was thinking of is Howie Carr. Oh, uh, yeah. The guy, there you like go. VB used to be his right hand man. Then he went, went, went to Fox 25. Okay. Local Fox channel uh, when they started their morning. Uh, I recognize that name. Right, right. And I actually got to talk to the guy for a while. And really? Pretty, well, he's a, he's a funny guy. He's a conservative guy and everything. And I, we didn't really... What happens at Radio Row during the primary is, you know, we'll get an influx of uh, people coming in, you know, whatever, candidates, blah, blah, blah. But then there's a period of downtime. So it's fun. All these broadcasters would be like, hey, I'll go talk to, I'll go talk to WBZ for a little while or you you know, you just you just kinda keep it going. Kind of mingle. Yeah, yeah. It was uh it was a lot of fun. We're looking forward to it. And like I said, Matt Connerton and myself will be uh will be giving it to you all live from Radio Row at the New Hampshire primary. All right. And I think you know what's gonna be cool about this, I think we're both doing our shows still. So like we'll do our shows in studio and then just run over to the double tree. Cool. Yeah, long day for you that day. Yeah, over time. But, but here's the thing, though, you know, after all is said and done, you know, we kind of wrap it up in the afternoon. I just hung out at the the DoubleTree because you know we got these cool looking, you know, we got these cool press passes, so we can go places that other people can't go. Absolutely. 
And I mean, it, it was great. I met Ted Danson. I met uh, George Stephanopoulos. Uh, it, it was really awesome. Is George really that short? Yes. He, Sam Malone? Yeah, yeah, Mayday Malone. Oh my God. Yeah, it was really cool because his, uh, his wife was a surrogate for Hillary Clinton, uh, the last primary. Yeah. So they came into town. Yeah. Okay. And I, I remember sitting because I think we were, we were all done and I was over at the bar at, uh, it was the Radisson then, or the, yeah, it was the Radisson. And someone said, yeah, Ted Danson, Ted Danson's in the lobby. And I immediately, and I'm not a starstruck guy. Like, I, you know, I, when you see someone famous or whatever, you want to be like, oh, hey, you know, and I tried to be, you know, I was cool. I just got a picture. Didn't want to bother him too much. And uh, it, it, it was awesome. It was quick. It was quick. He, he's rocking the real full head of white hair, actually, right? He's right. letting it go. But he has, but he has uh, uh, some fake hair also. Oh, yeah. okay. He, and even back on the days of, of, of Cheers, he was one of those kind of like, you know, I, I think it's kind of happening to me. Like in the back of my head, there's like, you know, he just has a little, he had a little, when, when he was on Cheers, he had this like little spot starting to happen and he used okay. to just cover that up. But uh, I'm not sure. It looks good though, right? Oh, he looks good. Uh, that, that's looks good. one of my favorite shows of all time. Oh, Cheers. Great show. It's okay. on. It's on Netflix right now. Oh, okay. It is great. Do you like the early Cheers with Coach or the later Cheers? Well, you know that's the the truth. There is Coach. I believe is only on for a season or two, um, and then you know Woody kept it going there for ten years or whatever it was, eight years. So great though, great. With they Woody. they were both great, and and Coach was hilarious too. They just had an episode where he was trying to go out with this girl, and she kept on denying him. And uh, his move was he fell down the stairs and she came running over and, are you all right? And <laughs> right. He stops and he goes, works every time. I think his name, the actor's name was Nicholas Calistano or yeah, something correct. like that. I think, I, I think he actually died, right? He, 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 yeah. he passed away during, during the run of Cheers. Yeah. And that's why they got uh, Woody Harrelson. It was a different vibe with, Will, with, Will, with Woody. Right. And then you could say Woody, Woody's character from Cheers... You know, it's very easy for an actor like that, with a character like that, to get to get stereotyped. But I mean, he went on to, he went on to be one of the most he's, successful actors from Cheers. He's probably a guy. If I, you know, when you you say, "Oh, I'd like to be him," you know, like Tom Brady or whatever. Right. Woody Harrelson might be a guy. You know, he chills out. He lives in Hawaii. You oh, know, yeah. he's smokes doves with Willie Nelson. He uh, is true detective. I don't know if you've seen that recently, but he's unbelievable in that. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Have you seen that? Darryl? No, I haven't True seen Detect it. True Detective. It's a one season though, right? It's one season. It was it was him and uh, Matthew McConaughey. They were unreal. It was the first. So they've done a couple of them. The first season was Matthew McConaughey and 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 uh, Woody Harrelson. I, think I may have saw. I may have seen an episode or two. Okay, not a lot. Crazy, right. creepy stuff. Like Pretty they weird. discovered a huge like sex thing going on with religion down in the Sun Belt. Like is, is it, the Sun Belt Louisiana? Louisiana? That's not. I don't know. I don't think so. I, I see. I don't know. That's, it's Louisiana, the Bayou. Is that the right. Bayou? Yeah. All right. It, it was set in Louisiana. So, anyways, great movie. Ah, uh, show. All right. Uh, I'm looking at these days today. I, I might even skip. These. White men can't jump. <laughs> well, I might skip these days for right now because I want to talk about something. I I, I watched uh, American Experience last night on PBS, which sounds uh. You know, right? Right. So, Sounds no. educational. Yeah, but it was all about uh, the fiftieth anniversary of Woodstock. Oh, okay. And it talked about how the three or four gentlemen got it going. They 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 had really planned it like three three years earlier, and how it turned into what it was and what it became. And it and it and you know, there's a movie out there, Woodstock, and this wasn't the movie, but it, it showed the town. People were starting to come like a week before. Woodstock, and then they realized, and these people never had never had seen so many people on their streets, and they, you know, they were just people. I mean, it was crazy. It turned out to be a half a million people. Oh, it, it, it was crazy. It became a free show. Originally, it was uh, eighteen dollars for all three days, and then people had just taken down the fence, and yeah. they said it's a free show. The freebie. They, they realized what was actually happening. They, re, you know what I mean, when they really realized what was happening. How many happening. people were actually there, and crazy crazy then they had all that rain that saturday of so did they lose money on it those guys did they actually lose money on it uh you know what i'm not sure if they lost money but they didn't make any money yeah but they, i mean think about it i mean that was we've been talking I, I wasn't alive yet but woodstock has always been something that people are talking about and it was only three days and there, there was so they, there was so many traffic jams that they had to uh, helicopter the artists in 
So it was it was it was awesome. It was upstate New York, right? Yeah, John Fogarty has a has had a great story last night where you know things got got going. They they couldn't play because it was raining and windy so hard. So they just they played during the night, and then with it raining still, John Fogarty said, "I got on stage. I could only see the first two rows of people. Other than that, it was a black abyss." Wow. And he's like, "Oh," and, and he got nervous, and then. uh He's like, okay, well, you can't see the audience. You couldn't. Really, it was nighttime. It was like two in the morning, right? And he's probably like twenty years old, <laughs> right? And so he's look, he's he's kind of looking out at the audience right before he started to play, and then he heard some guy like you know five hundred yard, you know, a hundred yards away or whatever, go, "We're with you, John." And then he he started playing. He goes, you know, he goes, "I played, I played my Woodstock set for that guy." Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was it was really cool. If you ever get a chance, I mean, I don't know if you like that kind of thing, but well, that's kind of your era, Daryl. Absolutely, it really is. There's a lot I mean, good stuff. So many artists play there. Sunday morning they woke up, or Monday morning they woke up, and they woke up to Jefferson Airplane, and that's how that's or uh, no, was it Sunday morning? Yeah, that might have been Sunday morning. Monday morning, when they when they finished, when they finished, when it was all over, Jimi Hendrix was the last person to uh, perform. Rock on! So pretty awesome stuff, anyway. I like it. It was great. PBS is great. They had Ken Burns documentaries are unbelievable, too. Oh, I, there's one documentary on, and you may have seen this if you're flipping the channels, because it's been on for years. But, you know, usually on PBS, they try to, you know, fundraise, so, yep. so they, they'll play like a Ken yep. Burns thing, but they'll also give you the chance to to donate to public... Uh, public radio. Public uh, television. Public and, you know, as a, you know as, a, as a gift, you'll get a, uh, you know... Ken Burns documentary. Yeah, right. We know how it goes, Peter. Oh, oh. okay, <laughs> okay, man. All right. I can't wait to hear what this show is. Come on. Well, well, now, now, now you made me forget. It's a show. You made we were me talking about a show, perhaps a documentary. It's always on. And it's oh yeah, on okay. The, the guy, the, okay, yes, the guy, Intern. the guy that that retired, and he basically went up to Alaska, got dropped off, and built and, and started from scratch and built his own little home there. And a little, have you ever seen I this? haven't I, seen that one. It, so. it, it is so great. It is so great. And he lived the rest of his life up there. Um, and he's no longer with us, but they, they're, the little cabin he had, I mean, he, he did everything from scratch. I mean, it, it was something. If you ever see it, check it out. Those guys are really resourceful. I, I often wonder, like, if something happens, how I would handle it, you know? Because I'm not, with my hands, I'm not that great building no, things. And Right. Well, I signed you up for Naked and Afraid. Have you ever seen that show? Yes. Okay. Do you think yeah. you could pull that off? Uh, no, I'll be sitting here on the couch. Guys. Right. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I couldn't do what it either. Naked and, afraid. naked and afraid. They take a woman and they take a man and then they they throw you in the middle of some jungle somewhere in the world, and you have to survive 21 days. Naked. No yes. supplies. Oh, you get to I'm bring. Sure they give you, you get, something. Well, yeah, you, you. Yeah, at the beginning of the show, they finally meet somewhere in the jungle, and they say, "What'd you bring?" And I, he goes, like, "I brought a fire starter." And someone will say, oh, I brought, I brought a, a hook or something so you can, whatever. So you basically have to make your, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, uh, what's the word? I'm like, see, I can't even think this morning. What's going on? Uh, they're a working shelter. together. Shelter. Yes. Uh, they start out in a they shelter. they have to hunt for food as well? Oh, they have to do yeah. everything. Oh, yeah, everything. Ooh. They have to, and they're naked. And they're naked. So when you're in the jungle, you know, there's, more, there's a lot of bugs. Yeah. And, and, and it shows them at night. Like, it, Yeah, that's what you, I, mean. I would never. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Not I'm not chance. much of a thrill seeker. There was one guy that that was driving down the road, getting ready to get dropped off, and he tapped out right then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's no, like, "Thank you." No, can't do it. Now that makes perfect sense. Right. Shannon <laughs> says it, it, it's called "Nude and Screwed." That was the original title. Yikes! <laughs> right. I wonder if any love connections happened during the uh, "Naked and Afraid." I bet you. I bet you. There's. I, think a, it's I would say there's at least out of all those episodes, there's there's one. I bet. I bet you're at right. At least. I bet you're right because you because it gets cold at night and they and they do they do use their body heat to uh, so oh, you, it's you an seem, experience you, ha you have right? to do there's it. There's not many people who go through that with you, so you know there's certainly a connection there. I'm sure I couldn't do it. No, I, I definitely couldn't do it. I couldn't do it in my own backyard. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like really? Well, that's because the neighbors would be calling the cops. So I well, probably. <laughs> probably. White's, White's had a couple beers again. He's out in his backyard. Yeah. Naked. It's funny that you say that because on uh, uh, Naked and Afraid, some guy found out from some berries how to make some sort of boozy juice so that they, they, yeah. they got buzzed. Cut it out. Yeah. 
That's pretty wild. Right. Yeah. Oh, Peter, what did you bring? Well, I brought a 12 pack. <laughs> <laughs> and some munchies. Oh, boy. Let's say good morning to our friend Vaughn Humboldt this morning. Uh, good morning, Vaughn. So, very well. He I'm must be the- making a run for. Uh, one of the, what does it list like the top five fans or is it just number Von one? Von Humboldt what? is a, I believe he is a top fan. I'd have to go look again. There's a few of them though. And then not only do you become a top fan, it tells you how long you've Where been you? a top fan. Oh, okay. You know, so some people out there, one month are on one month already. Wow. Amazing. All right. Uh, let's see. Je, uh, Jen Co- Jenny Coffee, who is uh, watching uh, on Facebook Live from the Netherlands. Wow. Yeah, she's way over there. Very cool. Where are the Netherlands, Daryl? Do you far, know? Far, far away. I know. Yeah, we are there. It's like Holland. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Amsterdam, Amsterdam, Holland. Yep. I thought you were going to say it's a, the, the Peter Pan story, but that's oh, nev- Neverland. That's Neverland. That's Neverland. <laughs> or Michael Jackson's uh, old ranch. There. No, I've actually, I've actually been to the Netherlands. Really? Yep. Amsterdam. Yeah, I bet. How was 18 that? 18 years old. Yeah, see, I've heard Amsterdam's quite a place. It was amazing. Um, you know, I was young, so I was doing other things, but beautiful bikes everywhere. You know, the canals going in the streets. A lot of windmills. Yeah, so I didn't see that because I was in the city. But like I said, clean city. Like you hear all this stuff. You know, there's a certain area where you can go to. You know, your demons are. Um, but the rest of the town is beautiful. Like going into Anne Frank's house was pretty. Uh, Oh yeah, so you did I, I remember. I was eighteen years old, and I you saw people the, sobbing. You like all, when you see old people sobbing, you know something's up. It hit the heart. Oh, Saving yeah. Private Ryan. Ryan was the only other experience I've had with that. Okay. Wow. At the movies, really? it was unreal. With crying. it was packed, and I was sitting next to an older gentleman who was bawling. Right, could have been a World War Two. That's vet, what I mean. Right. Oh God, I was crying. <laughs> wow, very good. All right, well, listen, uh, we'll say good morning to Gary Tibbetts, and we'll take a quick little break. We'll come back with Carol Robideau in Manchester, Inkling. You're listening to Peter White. Call us at 250-6007. It's the morning show. Good morning. This is your wake-up call. From ManchesterInkling.com, here's Carol Robideau. All right, here she is. Good morning, Carol. That intro always makes me feel like I should be in a boxing ring and I should be jumping out into the middle right now, banging my gloves. Da-da, right, da-da, right. It, it, it's, da-da, da-da. it's so epic. Kind of hyped now. Yeah, it gets you all fired up at 7.30 in the morning, Carol. Well, this may be, yeah. the, this may be the first time in morning show history that uh, I got Carol on three minutes late. Whoa. It's, right, Carol? Yeah, I think you're edging me out, Peter. No, no, I'm not. Before you know it, you're going to be calling me at 7.59, and you're going to say, okay, well, that's all the time we have. Time to go. Right. It's 7.33 already. <laughs> yeah, no, doesn't it go by fast? Jesus. No, it's right. fine. I'm Morning, okay. Carol. I know How late was I? I know oh, hey, Carol. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. I know you're a clock watcher, Peter, because you have to be. It's okay. Well, yeah, I do. Well, sometimes I don't look at the clock, and then when I look, I'm like, oh, my God, we've been we've been doing this now for 25 minutes? Talking about uh, whatever. Yeah, so we were just no. mentioning. We just mentioned uh, Woodstock, Carol. Do you? You must remember uh, when all that went down. I do. I was. I was just a little kid. I was probably like nine or ten. So I was like not quite uh, awake, I suppose, when it comes to, the, you know, the sort of the right whole peace, love. Of it. And- but yeah, but I, you know, I was, I was beginning to, to really. I mean, my mu- my love of music, was already festering. So. I was aware of it, but I, I've only, like you, come to learn more about it from documentaries or things like that because uh, there was so much to it, really, when you, when you look at it. And speaking of that, I have to say, um, I spoke yesterday with In Town Manchester, and um, uh, it so happens that the Woodstock 50 band is not going to be appearing next week. After no. all, they've they've had a they probably had to go have a summer of love someplace else. So we have a, a substitute. Okay. Pete Francis of Dispatch will be there, but it's it's uh, still going to be some peaceful, loving music. So. All right. All right. Let's take a. We got a call, Carol. Let's see uh, what's going on. Good morning. You're on the air. Yes. Uh, we're talking about Woodstock, right? Uh, yeah, we were. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I was going to go to that, and I remember back in 69, we had no idea, a bunch of us, we used to go to the uh, Jewish Community Center, play pool over there. Yeah, sure. And I remember all of us, while we were playing pool, talking about this concert. Now, no one really knew what it was about, or we just... You know, I was young. I was like around 17 years old. Sure, sure. And we got everything packed, and the car never started. Oh, no. And so we never never went. But I did. I'll tell you something. I went to a concert in 1973. It was the biggest till this, I guess, till this day. It's the biggest concert that I was ever... We have, you ever had in America? Really? 650,000. Like most... It was called Watkins Glen. Okay. Now, Watkins Glen is a racetrack. Yes. And uh, I remember, <laughs> now I want to get a little technical here. I remember all sitting around um, in my back room. I used to have the, uh, the black lights and uh, oh, the, sure. the, um, the paint. We used to do mm-hmm. paintings with the, with, the, with the paint that used to glow. Yeah, you know, everything. With the black yeah, everything was. Anyways, yeah, we were kind of high, kinda. and I remember we, we were talking about this concert. It was about maybe, I think of maybe about ten o'clock at night, and one one of my friends said, "Hey, you want to? Let's all go to Watkins Glen, man." And we agreed, and we did end up going there. Okay. The only problem with it was. We thought this was going to be like another Woodstock. Right. But Woodstock had a lot more people playing out there. All we had there was the Grateful Dead, the band, and the Allman Brothers. Okay. That's the only bands. That, uh, we were thinking, you know, Hendrix. Well, you know, wait, Hendrix was uh, still alive, 73. No, yes, he, he was, was dead. He, no, he, he died alive. in 70. He was alive. Well, I'll tell he you guys. Died in 1970. I'll tell you guys. Uh, Jimi Hendrix died on the day I was born. No kidding. Is that September, right? September 18th, 1970. Wow. Wow. And it sounds like pretty three, three pretty good bands there that you saw. What's that? I said it sounds like three good bands you saw. Oh, well, without a doubt. I mean, it was the original Allman Brothers, you know, with Dwayne Allman, Dickie Betts, you know, Oakley, Barry Oakley, um, uh, Greg Allman, the rest, you know, the whole band. And the band... Um, that was the original with uh, Rick Danko and, you know, the, the other boys there. I can't, Robbie Robinson. Uh, sure, sure. Um, Levon Hill. I can't Helms. remember their names. Yeah, Levon. It was the original. These were all original. They, you know, there was no replacements. And, um, I just remember there was a lot of people, you know, doing acid and stuff, but there was a lot of ODs on alcohol. Right. I was seeing people flop around me. There was just more people getting like hammered out of right. their minds on alcohol. I just remember this one guy. I don't know if he was on it. He had to be on acid, but yeah, they were on guy, something else too. I would say. No, this guy out of the this guy out of the blue was walking down this path. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like Adam of Adam and Eve. He had no clothes on, and his head was up in the air. Long beard. Long hair, stringy hair, hairy as a bastard, and uh, no clothes on, and he had his head up, looking up towards the sun with his arms out. Right. And he was just walking up the uh, path, like, kind of drooling. I mean, this guy was on a really bad acid trip or something, but... Um, or, or a good one. Yeah, it sounds it, like it might have been a pretty good yeah, one. <laughs> it, it, it was something else, but um, the uh, I got as far in... Um, as maybe from the stage, because we were off to the side, like off this path where people were walking up and down, and we kind of like slept off to the side. It was more in the woods. And uh, I remember getting up as close to the stage as maybe about, oh, shit, I'd say about 50 feet. And, you know, seeing the the uh, Allman Brothers. But the being that, Oh, the Grateful Dead were there, too. The Grateful Dead. Right, right. But I remember um, the band um, got most of the attention. 
that was, that was a complete fantastic, you know, group. Right, right. But it was like... Um, it wasn't Woodstock, it was right? More, it wasn't Woodstock, right. no. It wasn't Woodstock. Uh, Woodstock had a big, a, a lot bigger feel. This was at a... Watkins Glen is a racetrack. Yeah, it's a racetrack. And I saw something last night about when they used to have these music festivals, they used to have them at racetracks, and things got out of hand. And for some reason... Yeah, well, that's the... Remember the, um, remember the Altamont racetrack with the stones, where that guy got uh, stabbed in Right, it. right. And that Back was... In, a, uh, I think it was 19, the end of 1969 in December. Right, and I believe, and, uh, now was that the one, the Hells Angels, were the security for the Rolling Stones? Yes, they were. They were the sec- <laughs> yeah, they were the security, and they started, as a matter of fact, I think Marty Ballin from the uh, Jefferson Airplane yeah. um, got beat up by him. Oh, and a okay. lot of the bands, they were really pissed off, you know. Right. Um, they were pushing them. You know who's to blame on that, though, is the Rolling Stones. Sure. They've got a... Um, there's a movie I'll call, I b- believe it came out uh, in the 70s or whatever, called Gimme Shelter. Yeah. And it shows uh, Sonny, um, what the hell's his last name? Yeah, the, the big, the bi- what, the big uh, for, for the, Hell's Angels guy? He was, a hell, he was a Hell's, yeah, he was Sonny Barger. Okay, yeah. Well, he's on a, they got the tape of the stones inside a, like a hotel or a big, huge room. And they're playing back the tape on Mick Jagger. Right. And they see uh, Sonny Bob's going, I don't know who the F this Mick Jagger thinks he is. Right. But he brought us in there and blah, blah, blah. We were supposed to help him out. And now he's turning his back on us and blaming it on us. He can go F himself, you know. Right, right. Well, you know, they actually, the Hells Angels actually had a contract out on him. Okay. And they almost, they almost did it. Wow. They, I guess uh, Jagger was vacationing on some island or whatever, and these Hells Angels got on a boat, and something happened. I can't remember exactly what happened. Wow. But they never made it. I don't know if the boat broke down or whatever, but they never pursued it after that. Wow. They were going out to kill him. Crazy um, stuff. But, Crazy stuff in the late 60s, oh, early 70s. Oh, without a doubt. I saw the Beatles. In 1966 at Suffolk Downs. Wow. That's and something, too. you couldn't too. hear, yeah. You couldn't even couldn't hear the hear music. Nothing. Well, that's why the Beatles stopped touring, because their, their, their fans were so loud. Crazy. And, well, and, also, there was, you know, the PA system that they were playing Yeah, it's of not like today. Was what they, well, it was like, you know, what, you know, somebody would get up. It's the, uh, the PA system for, like, uh, okay, Joe, Joe Schmoll for uh, third baseman getting up. That's right. what they were playing out of. They couldn't hear nothing. Wow. Um, what the hell was it? Uh, oh, I saw the well, okay, uh, okay. original. <laughs> Listen, we... I saw the original um, Steppenwolf. Okay. I saw Janis Joplin. I saw the Young Rascals. I don't know if you ever heard of them. Oh, yeah. You've seen like, everybody, Little man. Eddie. Yeah, they stood right out with me. Uh, the uh, The Turtles. Okay. I was actually, yeah, I saw them. Um, who else was there? There was a bunch of them, a bunch of them that I did see. I, I apologize, but, uh, sir, I, I, but we got Carol on the line. Great stories oh, there. Oh, okay. Great stories. Okay. We appreciate that. Really? Thanks for the call and thanks for listening. Oh, hey, listen, one thing before I go. Hey, man, peace and love. <laughs> All right. Peace and love. Peace Adios. and love. Thank you. Wow. Now, that guy can call in any time because that sounds like he has some great stories. Yeah, great stories. So who was that guy? Do we know? No, we don't. I didn't. didn't well, we didn't get a chance to, to to ask. He had so many stories to My tell. My guess was Louis Applebaum. No, that was <laughs> that wasn't Lou. That wasn't Lou. Well, that wasn't Lou. If he's if he's in the if he's in the Facebook live room, he should let us know who he was. Yeah. Wow. But good stories. I like that. I do. So, Carol, what's going on? Uh, what's going on with you? Um, I know there's some stuff now. The robot came to uh, City Hall yesterday. Yeah, robot came. I, I'm I'm halfway done writing that story, but um, we, uh, Jim decided to take the day off for his birthday yesterday. So uh, at, at, yeah, because I mentioned that in the morning. I oh, said, you should, yeah. yeah, I said you should take the day off. No, he did. He didn't even hear that, but he did. Did he call in uh, sick? Yeah, well, he actually. I mean, he was not feeling great in the morning. He Hello, said, I'm not gonna make. <coughs> I'm not yeah, gonna make yeah. it in today. You know, yeah, we've all but, done but, that. Uh, but, um, you know, he works hard, so he deserves a day off anyway. Absolutely. But we ended up going to see a movie last night at 10 o'clock. Um, 
uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. how was that? How, how did you like it, Carol? Right in with the, fits right in with the timing because it was 1969. Um, Tarantino, right? Was, yeah, Tarantino. Yeah. And it was, yeah. uh, you know, it, it revolves around the um, actual, you know, the, the, the thing is the title is pretty fitting because it's a, it's a, like a fairy tale version of the Manson family uh, murder. Um, right. If that could be a fairy tale. So, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was Tarantino. So there, there's a lot of violence in, in, in various scenes, but it was really good. Brad Pitt and, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Matt Damon, I believe, right? Leo, DiCaprio. No, Leo DiCaprio. Oh, Leo yeah, DiCaprio. They were, they were really good together and it was, um, compelling. You know, they were good characters, compelling characters and, um, it was well done and, um, you know, it's a good movie, but it wasn't um, not probably not everybody's cup of tea. But it I've been was, hearing good. Long. I've been hearing good reviews on that movie. Yeah, yeah I like think it. just if his name like carries it sometimes, you know. But if you like that style of movie, you know, it's it's it, it's delivers, you know, and and it's an interesting way of looking at uh, history. You know, what if uh, something happened different than what happened? You know, the so, alternate reality, right? He mud- yeah. he muddled history again. Well, it, it, it wasn't exactly muddled. It was just like, what if these guys existed okay. and happened to, you know, the, the premise is that they, they, the, uh, Leo DiCaprio is like a, you know, kind of a fading star and, and Brad Pitt's his stunt double and they've been together, you know, for a long time, kind of like a buddy movie really. And, and then they live right next door to Roman Pulaski in the Hollywood Hills. And, um, so okay their existence in that alternate reality changes the course of history um, as we know it, you know, so it's a kind of those what if type of movies, but very interesting. Yeah. My first report, Carol, in high school, freshman year, um, you know, you had to do, it's like your first five pager or whatever, and you had to do research. My topic was Charles Manson. Wow. It scared the crap out of me. Oh yeah. I remember watching the um, movie that the guy who prosecuted him made. Oh, Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter. Yeah. And I had to turn it off and I run think it was downstairs. Vincent Bugliosi? But yeah, exactly. All right, yeah, that was a. <sighs> and then there was a girl who actually came from New Hampshire who was part of that clan there who got prosecuted. That's right. You're right. So that, yeah, that, no, that stuff just, fascinates me. And, and Charles Manson doesn't, you know, he has like one scene in the movie where he's in the very beginning, sort of, he wanders onto the property. Thinking it's it used to be the house where Roman Pl- Polanski lives used to belong to like one of the Beach Boys or something. So he's there looking for right. someone and uh, it's not there. And that's all you see of him. But uh, the rest of it, you know, plays out without Charles Manson. So well, we have a um, we have another call. Let's take our chances, Carol. Good morning. You're on the air. It's fine with me. Yeah. It's hello. Yeah. Yeah. Who's this? It's me again. Oh, good. Um, I got a, I <laughs> so got a story. I got a story. I have a story to tell you about Manson. Well, hold on a second. Okay, Who, you got to at least give your first name so we can address you. I, I'll give you. I'll say it's Tom. Okay. Let's put it that way. All right, Tom. Okay. Um, I lived in a commune out in Ocean oh. Beach, part of San Diego, back in awesome 73. Place. Awesome place. So it was um, a very short time that I lived there. But in this commune, it was probably about maybe, I'd say about 10, 15 people living in this huge place right up on like like a little cliff looking o- right next to the beach. Yeah, right? sure. Anyways, I met some people. I'll try to make this short. I met some people that were actually in the Manson clan. Okay. And they were in the Manson clan. They only came by and visited they were in the Manson clan for a very short period of time. They weren't anybody big like, you know, Susan Atkins and Crank Winkle and all those people. Tex Watson. What's that? Tex, Tex Watson, Watson and all those. Right. And, um, well, Linda Kasabian, was, Linda, Linda Kasabian was from New Hampshire, Mount Vernon. I yep. got to tell you, this is what I'm building up to. Oh, okay. I'm Linda sorry. Linda Kasabian. Linda Kas- let me get right to the point. All right. You made I out used to be in sp- I used to be. I used to be in sports. Okay, and then I became a hippie, and I kind of used lived a, like a dual life. And um, there used to be a place called. You guys are probably too young to remember this, but right across the street from Central High, 
There used to be a call, place called Nick's Lunch. All right. And the diehards, there used to be a motorcycle group called the diehards. And, the, you know, Paul Lemire, Tierney, um, what the hell is his name? Tony Arbor. You know, these are just a few names that were in this group. Well, anyways, um, many, many, many years went by, ended up getting married, and I knew Tony Arbor, I knew Paul Lemire, all these guys. They're right. pretty tough guys. Um, so anyways, I remember I got married, and I was coming off the highway. I forget what exit it was, but it was on Hanover Street, and I went to this gas station, and who do I see there? is Tony Arbor. Okay. And Tony Arbor goes, hey, man, what are you doing? What's going on? And I said, uh, well, I'm married now, blah, blah, blah. He goes, listen, if you're really into partying, we're going to the Milford Quarry tonight. You're never going to believe who's going to be there. And I said, who? He goes, Linda Kasabian, but her real name is Linda Christian now. She actually changed her name to Linda Christian. Right. And he goes, come on by, man. We're going to have a few beers, you know, smoke a couple of joints or whatever. I said, nah, Tony, that's not my uh, my you, cup of tea You anymore. don't do that anymore. But she, what's that? Oh, that's what I was saying. You were saying you didn't do that kind of thing anymore. You were Yeah, married. I mean, it was right. many years, many years went by. Right. But if I would have went there, Linda Kasabian, which she changed her name to Linda Christian, she would have been there. Okay. Which is really what a freaky thing that you're mentioning this on on the on the air right now. But so she was um, out. Well, her, she did time, right? She was so in she jail. Was, well, she was the one that actually what her testimony. A, her testimony right. See, put, Linda, Charlie, Linda Kasa- Lin- put Charlie Linda behind Kasabian, bars. Okay. Yeah, Linda Kasabian didn't kill anybody. What she was, she was she watched. She was on the watch. Right. She was in the car. She sat out in the car and watched. You know, they killed Steve Parent first, the kid that was living in the back, and then they went in there. And from what I understand now, according to Susan Atkins, Susan Atkins says she did not stab anybody. Krenwickel didn't stab anybody. And I forget the other one's name. But she said Tex Watson is the one that did all those killings. Right. Susan Atkins, you can see the video right on the Internet. She claims that she was ready to stab, I think it was um uh, one Folger or one of the uh, people in there, right? The Folger and uh, she says empire. that something came over her and she felt something like holding her arm back, and she couldn't do it. And she said that's when Tex went over, and she said that Tex. She said she's never seen any human being like this. It's like right. she gave a description of you know when a person gets crazy and they can lift up a car. Sure, she says that Tex Watson was so angry and so out of his mind that he was just so violent with any, everybody. She claims that she really didn't do it. It was him. Right. He did, the, he did the whole thing, which I really can't believe, because what about the people out in the, that uh, Abigail Folger and the other sure. one that was out on the um, you know front lawn, whatever? You can't be... In two, two places, places at, at once. once you know? Right, right. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you know? I'd love for you to call back like some, uh, tomorrow morning or something because these stories you have are great. They they really yeah are. yeah. It just I, I when when uh, Carol her name was Carol. Yes, Carol Robido, Manchester. Yeah, when she mentioned that thing about Manson, I go, I got to call these guys and tell them this. You know. So, anyways, it's it's quite a story and. Um, I'll let you go anyways. I'll be quick on it. Yeah, yeah. but thank you so much, uh, Tom. And please, like, call back again. These stories that you have are fantastic. All right. Hey, have a good day. All Bye-bye. right. You too. Tom there from uh, Manchester. And you know what's funny? Uh, Louis Applebaum says uh, the the uh, the Beatles played at Shea Stadium. Well, they did also play at Suffolk Downs. Uh, they played at Suffolk Downs Thursday, August 18th, 1966. That's right. Clear that up. Clear that right up. All right, Kara, we only have a few minutes because I got the presidential <laughs> candidate coming on. I apologize. No problem. But what, what you know, the, the 1969, though, you know, I didn't mean to spend the whole half hour here talking about 1969, but what, what an amazing year of so many things going on. A lot of stuff. Right. Crazy. Yeah. So anyway, but the movie's good if, if, you, if you're interested at all in all of this. I think, it, you know, I think it's important for anybody that goes to the movie to have some basic knowledge and understanding about what actually happened 
because I think there's a lot of stuff built into the movie um, that that you need to, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on, uh, you know, otherwise. But it's, it is a good movie. So, so like, so. the premise is these guys kind of stop that from happening? Yeah, the premise is that because of their existence as neighbors, yeah, really um, stop and, the, it. and 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 just their happening, you know, their their interaction with um, uh, in happenstance, you know, Brad Pitt ends up going to the Spawn Ranch to give somebody like a hitchhiker a ride there, and then he interacts because because uh, the guy that owned the ranch, um, he he was um, Brad Pitt was a, a you know a stuntman, so. They had filmed a bunch of TV shows there. This this long running series that that had had been made um, uh, Leo DiCaprio famous in his heyday. Right. So he knew the ranch and he knew the guy, and he he started asking questions and he got a little suspicious. And then sort of uh, that culminates in the in the big finish, which is terrific. So yeah, it's good. I, I believe that guy who owned the ranch also died as well. Charlie yeah. Manson killed him. I don't think Charles Manson actually That's what killed I mean. anybody. I'm saying, right. I'm not saying that. I'm saying. Okay, I didn't mean, I'm not starting. Jeez, I'm not now we're getting technical. Now we're getting technical. Wow. Well, I mean, come on. <sighs> the theory. Wow. Crazy stuff, though. Really? What a crazy year. I'm glad I was born in 1970. Yeah. You don't want to be part of that whole 1969 stuff. Yeah. yeah. It was a hell of a year, I tell you that. Well, yeah. It was the end of a decade, too. Like a, a very tumultuous decade. Quite. The 1960s. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Carol, I don't know. Uh, I wanted to talk yeah. to you about the grant that West High School got for a uh, facelift, but I guess we can do that tomorrow. Yeah, we can do that tomorrow. It's fine. All right. Well, I feel we like we buy, haven't even said anything need, to you. It, that's okay. Um, no, it's not okay. It's the summertime. It bothers it's summertime. me. It, it's going to bother me all day. Oh, come on, Peter. It's no, it does. Okay. She did. She told us about going <laughs> to the movie. That okay. was pretty... Uh, <laughs> Thanks, this man. is what the I'm morning go show is about, though. You know, reader, re, uh, reader, viewer, listener interaction, and all that. That's you know, you want people to feel welcome to call in anytime. Sure, That's sure. Fine. What time yeah. that movie get done, Carol? Well, we got home around one a.m. Oh man, yeah, that's, been, that's been, a long I, night. I had been sleeping for like five hours already. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, we it was like dinner and a movie. We drove through Wendy's first. <laughs> and then we and then we ate our burgers and our frosty and our fries and then we went in for the movie and got a big popcorn. Oh, well, there you That's go. You know rolled. what? Good for you guys, though. Keeping it simple. More people yeah. need to do that, Carol. Yeah, it was good. All right, Carol. Well, listen, I'm going to get ready for our uh, our uh, next. Do we call him Senator Bolton? Is that uh, what we're saying? No, uh, no. We would say Congressman. Congressman. I would assume yes. So. Um... All right. All Good right, Carol. Your interview. Yeah. Well, thank, right. thank you so much, and uh, we will uh, do it again tomorrow. All right. All hey right, guys. Carol. Bye, Have Carol. a great day. That's Carol Robido, Manchester Ink Link, where everything in Manchester connects. You can find out what's going on around town at ManchesterInkLink.com. The Morning Show is sponsored by CGI Business Solutions, uh, located at 171 Londonderry Turnpike in Hooksit. They serve all your big and small business needs, employee benefits planning, corporate design and business administration, investments in wealth management, customized business insurance solutions. Their phone number is 866-841-4600. On the web at cgibusinesssolutions.com.
You're listening to Peter White. Call us at 250-6007. It's the morning show. WMNH 95.3 FM. Good morning, Manchester. All right, we are back here this morning. Good morning, everyone. The morning show continues. We got Daryl Dion at the desk today. Good morning. Good morning. Matt Cushane is here. Good morning. And good morning, everybody. We are uh, very excited. To, uh, wow, that was a that was a great great conversation with Tom. So he just came out of nowhere, right? Out of nowhere. But he seems to be uh, have done a lot. Apparently, right? Seen the Beatles? Jeez, did you have you ever seen the Beatles, Daryl? No. Now, were you? Did you want to back in the day? Sure. Right. Who didn't? Right. Absolutely. Then they stopped touring. All right, coming up this hour, right, uh, right in a few minutes, uh, we should have candidate for president of the United States, Congressman Seth Moulton, calling in uh, from Massachusetts, and he's going to be coming up here. Wants to introduce everyone, uh, uh, you know, introduce himself to everyone uh, in Manchester and in New Hampshire. So uh, uh, we're looking forward to it. It's our. It was the first uh, can uh, first uh, campaign to reach out. Uh, so that is fantastic. I hope uh, a lot cool. of these a lot of these candidates are all welcome. Whether you're a uh, Republican, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're an Independent, please drop on by and introduce yourself because, uh, believe it or not, that New Hampshire primary is going to come up real quick, real quick. And I think something we can all respect is how much effort and time these people actually put into running. And like, that's not an easy thing. And you got to be no. on all you right. Imagine having to be on all the time and like constantly scrutinized, right? You know, and like. You can't just relax and, you know, you're always worried about saying the right or wrong thing. Sure, and, sure. So, I, I go, don't know. I go, I, I go through it every morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, it's like, it's funny when you, when you put yourself out there, no matter, no matter who you are, whether you're in politics or you're a musician, you know, people are going to criticize you, you know, no matter what. I mean, you could be the greatest guy in the world at your profession, but you're always going to have that criticism. Find yep. something. Especially if you're really out there and you do have a following, you know? So, wow. So, I don't know. Now, this guy, the, the, um, Congressman Moulton wasn't at the uh, debates. We, we mentioned that, the CNN debates. Uh, so, when we don't know when the next debates are, correct? We believe it's September, but I'm not positive. Right. Uh, Daryl's your guy here. Daryl's your political correspondent <laughs> coming he, up. Is he really? No, uh, I think he is. <laughs> Do you want to be the I'm political? I'm proud of you, Daryl, for getting all fired up about this. I've seen a change in your demeanor towards politics in the past year. A, a it bit. drives him crazy, bit. though. Yeah, but it should. Well, I know. I, I don't know. Part of part of what, it, if I can just, if while well, we get a couple minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Um Watching like the Civil War, I watched the Civil War Ken Burns thing. Oof. I think one of the biggest things that our society is struggling with now is life was never fun for people. Like right. you, you think generations and generations back, it wasn't like fun. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. And now it seems like our whole like thing is just to have fun. Right. It's all about and it's entertainment. Like, you know, let the kids have fun. Let the um, retired community have fun. But when you're 30 years old... Stop you're not out. supposed to be having fun. You're supposed to be getting working your butt off and like. Right. I don't know. And trust me, I've. And it's okay I've to have done fun. It, you it's know? okay to have fun in your thirties, but you do have to just like any, just like you should have fun throughout your whole life. But I know, right. what, I know what you're saying, Matt. There's times to have fun. There's times to work hard. There's times to you know do all that. Stuff. Right. And it just seems to me, it just seems like it's a little skewed and I, very entertainment based. Like we always. <sighs> As human beings, it feels these days we always have to be entertained. I think that's why what you're trying to say. Something, I don't know. And then I say, God, do I belong in Walden Pond? You know, do I belong to that guy in Alaska just getting away? But Right. Uh, you should try a commune. Do they still have those, Daryl? <laughs> yeah, the you problem is I'm useless. They'd be like, this guy's useless. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. What do you, what, yeah, what, what get would, out of here. What, he, he can't contribute anything. What this would be your all role? over the place. I right. tell you. Oof. Yeah. All over the place is right. And, uh, you know, just piggybacking on that, um, we have an event coming up. Okay. And you guys are invited. We're keeping it small. Um, in regards to adults, we reached out to the politicians pretty much. That's it. But um, you guys are, as members of the whole program, you guys are certainly welcome. Okay. Oh, the congressman's on? Uh, I believe yeah, so. Yeah, fine. Then I'll talk about that later. All right. Good morning. You're on the air. Uh, hello? 
Hello there. Good morning. Con- Congressman? Can you hear me? Yeah, good morning. Can you hear us? It's very faint for some reason. Okay. Okay. It's the phone line. I, I, yeah. I'll, put, I'll put my volume on maximum here. All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. Congressman Moulton, correct? Yes. Okay, well, thank you for calling How us. How are you? Good, how are you? Uh, my name is Peter Good, White. thank you. You're, my name is Peter White. You're here with uh, Matt Cushane and Daryl Dion also. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning. Okay, well, I, uh, I introduced, uh, I kind of uh, talked about uh, you are a congressman uh, from our neighbors to the south, Massachusetts, in the 8th District, correct? The 6th District. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. The sixth district. Okay. Oh God, uh, he's going to blame his intern, Congressman. No, no boy. No, <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not blame. I will blame it on my poor eyesight, and I do need an eye test. But, I don't think anyone really cares what number district you're from. I don't think it really matters. Yeah. You know? but, but I. I so I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> I wanted to be. I wanted to be prepared for you, sir. <laughs> it's all good. It's so, all good. So uh, it's nice to be back in New Hampshire. Yeah, uh, we welcome you. We where, welcome where are you right now? Uh, right now, I am on 95, um, headed up towards North Conway. Um, we're going to meet with uh, Conway Daily Sun and, and head back to a place where I spent a lot of summers uh, working on the railroad up there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, wonderful. So Jack you got some New Hampshire with, ties. Uh, spent some time in engine service and, uh, and spent a lot of summers there. Uh, Boiling away with a with a great crew of people, and so it's familiar territory for me. Okay, that's great. That's that's wonderful. I wanted I wanted to start by saying to you, uh, uh, thank you for your service, uh, Congressman Moulton. Here uh, was in the United States Marines Corps, and you did some tours in Iraq, correct? That's right. Uh, I did four tours in the Marine Corps infantry, so I was on the ground, um, you know, fighting with these amazing eighteen year olds, largely um, who are who are always on the front lines of our nation's military, and one of the proudest experiences of my life to be able to serve with them. You know, even though I was an outspoken critic of the war, I was uh, very critical of the Iraq War, but I was proud to go, so no one had to go in my place. And I and I did four tours there, uh, serving with some of the, some of the most amazing Americans I've ever met. Oh yeah, I, I mean, like I said, thank you for your service. It te- you know, that's a uh, that that's a. Uh... That's 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 great. I don't know. See, I'm not a veteran, but I do. I I do appreciate. And none of us here are, I believe. But uh, I will tell you, thank you so much because it's. Uh, if it wasn't for you in the military, you know, we wouldn't have all our freedoms. Well, I appreciate that, and um, you know, it's it's a it's a different perspective that I bring to this race uh, than than other candidates. There's some other great veterans in the race. I'm the only uh, combat veteran who's who's fought on the ground, led troops. Uh, in in actual combat, and um, and I just have so much respect for all the the people who serve. Many of them uh, younger than me. I signed up when I was twenty two, uh, but a lot of uh, people sign up when they're seventeen years old, and that takes a lot of courage, a lot of dedication to this country. And I have undying respect for for those who serve, uh, yes. even though some of us you know often disagree with the, the policies or the um, the presidents that we serve under. Now, I, I think, may I just interject real quick? I, I think it's listening to you speak, sir. I love that you didn't you didn't approve of the war, but you still did what you had to do. And I think that's something that's really lost um, on our country in in these times, for sure. Well, that's the thing is that, you know, a lot of times um, people have to serve in unpopular wars. And, you know, you don't always get to choose the, the policy. You don't always get to, you know, your your choice for president or whoever doesn't always get elected. But someone has to go. And when you have a person like Donald Trump who uh, lies about his feet, um, you know, has a doctor create a false diagnosis of bone spurs so that he doesn't have to go to war. Right. It's not like there's an empty seat with Donald Trump's name on it. Someone has to go in his place, some American hero. I mean, I'd like to meet the American hero who went in Donald Trump's place to Vietnam, another unpopular war. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I hope he's still alive. Well, let me ask you this. Now, I, I understand that you joined the Marines right before uh, everything, you know, let's just say a lot, uh, everything changed after the September 11th attacks. And you were just, you were just, uh, just joined the Marines a few months before the September 11th attacks, right? 
Uh, yes, technically I had decided to join before, but my training didn't actually start until after September 11th because the fall class was full that year. So my training started in January of 2002, and, um, you know, right when we were invading Afghanistan. Right. So, wow. Wow. Now, what, the what, morale must have been pretty good at that point, though, wouldn't you say, where everybody was like, yeah, let's go do this? You're right. That's a good question. The um, morale was, was quite high uh, because at that time, you know, we weren't in these endless wars. People just thought, okay, we've got to respond. We've got to do something. And, you know, it's interesting. A, a few months before September 11th, when I had decided to sign up, uh, most of my friends thought I was nuts. Yep. You know, they said, this is, this is crazy. Why are you doing this? No one does this anymore. Um, and then all of a sudden, September 11th happens, and there are lines outside of recruiting stations. And I felt, you know, proud to have made the decision to serve in advance. And I remember actually sitting in <laughs> sitting in um, the bunk car I stayed in up in North Conway, and um, because it was, I was on a track crew in the middle of Crawford Notch when September 11th, when the attacks happened yep. uh, on September 11th. Um, and we came back, we, we quit early and, and came back to try to understand what was going on. I remember sitting there and watching the news and thinking, you know, I was, I was proud to be in a position where I was one of the few Americans who might be able to actually do something about these terrorist attacks. Right. Uh, of course, I was nervous, too, because, you know, I didn't um, know exactly what I'd be getting into. It seemed likely that the nation would go to war and, um, I, you know, maybe was in the right place at the right time to, to help out. Oh, yeah. Now, Congressman, you were one of the first uh, service members to uh, uh, enter, enter the city of Baghdad at the beginning of the Iraq War? That's right. I was in the first company of Marines into Baghdad. Um, you know, the funny thing is I, I mentioned my training started in 2002, right, when we were invading Afghanistan. Sure. You know, we all went through 2002 assuming that we had just missed the war because Afghanistan would probably be quick and easy, we thought, uh, just like the Persian Gulf War. And we'd be in and out, and by the time we finished training, the war would be over. Of course, we had no idea that um, that not only would Afghanistan continue for uh, for years, it's still going on today, uh, but that we'd be invading Iraq. And so my training finished in December of 2002. I got to my unit. Um, well, actually, I came home for Christmas, and I got a call from my battalion executive officer, and he said, uh, when are you coming to California to join the unit? And I said, well, I'm coming out in a month. And he said, nope, you got to come out in a week, uh, make sure you get a will, and uh, we're going to get on a ship and go to Iraq. Wow. And that was on Christmas Eve of 2002, and you know, a few months later, I was invading Baghdad with, uh, with the Marine Corps. Wow. Did you wait to tell your parents till after Christmas <laughs> that you were going? I certainly didn't tell them that they asked me yeah. to get a will. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, right. No, no kidding. Well, let me say, you have quite the resume. You were born in Marblehead. Uh, you grew up in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Uh, graduated from Phillips Academy. You uh, got a bachelor's degree in physics from Harvard University. Uh, it, it's impressive, sir. Well, you know, my grades weren't all that impressive. But <laughs> well, uh, um, I, loved, I loved science. and um, I was really inspired by a public school uh, science. Oh, yeah. Um, to, to pursue science. And um, I loved it. I studied it. I think it gives me a great background. And it, and it makes me one of the only members of Congress with a degree in science. And, you know, and everyone complains about how uh, they can't um, do anything about climate change or, um, you know, recognize uh, the statistics when it comes to what we could change about gun violence and all these different issues. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to just offer that perspective as someone who's, who studied it and believes in science and supports science and wants more people to study it as well. Well, listen, let me tell you, before we get into your presidential campaign, uh, I, I, I want to say thank you. Your campaign was the first to reach out uh, to us here at WMNH. And like I said, we we'll, we'll, we have, you know, the New Hampshire primary, as you know, is, is, is such a big deal. Uh, we try to showcase everybody that wants to come on, every anybody that wants to come on. And your campaign was the first to... Uh, get a hold of us so i got kind of excited uh if if you're in manchester sometime i'm going to give you the invitation right now we'd love to have you come into the studio and talk to us also 
Oh, I'd love to do that. And we are... We yeah, are, no, I've, I've heard great things about your show, so it's an honor to be on. Well, thank you so much. And, and you're actually our neighbor to the south, you know? We're all, we're all New Englanders, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're all na- New Englanders. We're all Red Sox and Pats fans, right? Yeah, that, well, there you I have it. I don't know about that part. Well, yeah, Daryl's not here. He's one of those... You know how there's those, those uh, percentage of people that don't like the home, te- home teams? <laughs> Well, not in New England. My gosh, Daryl, who's, who's your team? Oh, I've been a Raiders fan my whole life. Well, since uh, you know, since oh, the sixties. Right, oh, I know. I don't have much to say to that. But... No, I don't have much right. to say about it. Either. <laughs> <laughs> They're on hard knocks though this year, yes, and I bet you are. that's going to be good because Gruden, Gruden is uh, he, <laughs> he cracks me up. He's a wild man. All right, Congressman, you've you've uh, you announced your candidacy uh, for president on April twenty second. That's right. I was one of the last to get into the race, and a lot of people ask me why that's the case. Uh, I have my first first child at home. Uh, my amazing oh, wife Liz and I have a beautiful daughter, Emmy, um, and it just you know I wasn't going to get in when she was two or three months old, which is when most of the other candidates got in, and we're first time parents still figuring it all out. Oh, your wife uh, would have so killed So I got you. in at the end of April, and of course it's a, a very crowded field now, uh, but I'm proud to be in this race. Now, I understand that you weren't at the debates. When we were talking about this earlier now, what does a candidate have to do? What, what, are the, what is the criteria to get, uh, get on stage at these national debates? Well, in the first, uh, for the first two debates, the criteria was 60,000 individual donors or, or 1% in the polls. It doesn't sound like much, uh, but the fact of the matter is we, we qualified according to 12 different polls for the last debate. Uh, but the Democratic National Establishment in Washington, D.C., for whatever reason, chose not to count those polls. So I don't really have a, an explanation for why they're picking and choosing uh, polls. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, the message that I've been uh, talking about, about how it's important to take on Donald Trump, not just as president, but as commander-in-chief, because he's completely failing to keep us safe, uh, about how I've uh, got the most ambitious a national service program, the most ambitious mental health care proposal out there. Uh, these messages are really resonating with voters on the ground. And what I hear from people is, you know, they like the perspective of a combat veteran on the debate stage when we're in the longest war in American history. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's up to the Democratic establishment in D.C. who gets to be on these debate stages. And, uh, and, and so far, we, we haven't made it. And I, I, I knew that was a risk of getting in the race late. Um, but we're just campaigning on the ground because I think that too many people right now in this race are focused on simply qualifying for the next debate right. rather than presenting an optimistic vision for the country or a real strategy to defeat Donald Trump. Co- Congressman, just, just hearing that, right? If you, you look at like the um, temperature or the gauge of the society in America right now, for me, just listening to you hearing, well, the Democratic you know, Party or whatever was making decisions and didn't put you in there, Things like that really turn somebody like myself off, and um, I was just wondering, like, I think there's a lot of Americans, and especially younger Americans who can vote, who are just turned off by politics in general. How can how can we change something like that? Because I, I think that's something that's really important to get more people involved and take pride in our country. But they hear things like that, and I, I have personal experiences with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party where I disagree. How, how do you understand my question is probably almost more of a... I, I think I do. I mean, because, I, look, I, I share some of your frustration. I think that a lot of Americans feel like these, the party establishment in, in D.C., whether it's the Republican uh, establishment or the Democratic establishment, they just you know, aren't really representing the real needs of, of Americans across the country. And so what I encourage people to do is find candidates like myself who are willing to challenge that, who are willing to challenge the party leadership or the party establishment. You know, in my first race, I took on an 18-year incumbent in Massachusetts. He'd been reelected nine times, and I didn't know much about politics. I didn't have any background in politics or family history in politics or anything like that when I got in the race. I just knew that I didn't want to see mistakes like I saw happen on the ground in Iraq um, due to poor leadership in Washington happen again. So I said, I think we, we can do better than this 18-year incumbent. He's only passed one bill in 18 years. And so I got in the race. And when I did, the Massachusetts Democratic establishment told me that not only are you, are you going to lose this race, uh, but by daring to take on an 18-year incumbent, someone 
you know, in the in the Democratic establishment in Massachusetts, you're never going to be able to be in politics again. You'll never run for anything again in, in your life. Um, and what they were saying to to me, to this young combat veteran, was do not participate in the democracy you just risked your life to defend. Right. right. And of course that's wrong. That's so wrong. Um, so I'll tell you what they were right about, though. It was a tough race. It yeah. was a much tougher race than I imagined. So uh, he was the Democrat that you ran against? Was, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm yes. sorry. I, I said, was the guy that you were running against, was he a Democrat as well? Yes, he was a Democrat as well, and that's why they were right. upset. Right, exactly. They wanted to keep that seat the, there. Right, in the party establishment, right? Yeah. And, um, and so we did our first poll when I was seven months in, and I was 53 points down, which is which is pretty bad. I mean, I'm not even 53 points behind Biden right now <laughs> in this race. So, so it, was a, it, was a, it was a pretty rough go, but, um, but, but I just kept fighting and kept meeting voters on the ground and, and sharing my message and explaining that I was someone who came to this with an independent mindset, and I wasn't just going to do what the party leaders in Washington told me to do. I was going to do what I thought was right. And sure. I ended up winning that primary by 11 points, uh, so a 64-point comeback. And then, um, and then went on to win a tough general election in a, in a district that voted by 13 points for our Republican governor. Uh, I won the race by 14. Yep. So I convinced an awful lot of people, not just Democrats, to vote for me, um, but independents and Republicans as well. And I think that that's the kind of leadership that we need. Um, you know, I think that's the kind of leadership we need in this presidential race. Uh, I think we need someone to be our Democratic nominee who can pull together a coalition that includes everybody in the Democratic primary, you know, everybody in the Democratic Party, sure. uh, plus independents like those Obama-Trump voters we hear a lot about, and even some disaffected Republicans. That's the broad coalition that we're going to need to build if we're going to win this race, and that's the broad coalition that I had to build in my first race for Congress. Okay. And Great I know, answer. Great I know, answer. I know you have a, a bunch of other interviews uh, this morning, and you have a few minutes left. Um, I mean, there's so, ma there's so many things and so many issues we can talk about, which maybe we can talk about when we have you uh, in studio sometime. Sure. But I wanted, sure. I wanted to give you the opportunity right now to, uh, to uh, talk to the people of uh, Manchester and, and, you know, the surrounding towns here in, here, uh, in New Hampshire. Um, you know, well, Peter, what? what are some problems that we're facing? Oh, we got all kinds. Of, are you asking me? A question? I'm asking about, you personally. Well, we have. Oh, well, you have the border security thing that everyone talks about. You you talk about uh, just just the economy. Um, you can talk about uh, cyber security. Yeah. Uh, you you got the big education. You got the big education. You got the big marijuana debate. Yep. I mean, it, it, it's all out there. So, I mean, there's so many things we can talk, talk to you about. So I, we'd love to get you in studio next time, you're, uh, next time you're in town, Congressman. Well, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk about all of those things. And I think people would find that I have uh, independent and thoughtful positions on those, on those issues that, uh, that I think are where the majority of Americans are. Uh, you know, I'm not taking extreme positions on any of those things. I'm, uh, I'm someone who believes in just doing the right thing. And um, and actually making progress, you know, I was named one of the most effective uh, Democrats in, in Washington, the most effective freshman Democrat when I was first elected. I held more town halls than any other Democrat in the, in the entire Congress. And I'm not afraid to work with Republicans when it comes to getting things done. I'm also not afraid to take them on, though. And uh, right. I played a huge role in taking back that. Right. And balance is what I'm all about. And I'd be happy to talk to you about it more. Okay. Well, listen, th I want to thank you so much for calling in this morning. It was great to, to get to know you. Um, like I said, a, a continuous invitation. You can, uh, next time you're in town, just let us know. And, uh, you know, we'd love to, we'd love to have you in studio. So we are going to, uh, we are going to let you go. I want to, I want to thank you. All right, great. Well, thanks so much. And I will, uh, is there anything you would like to, to end with, uh, to tell the people of Manchester, New Hampshire? I'd just say that I'm proud to be up in New Hampshire today uh, yet again and um, proud to be running for president. Uh, I'm, I'm an underdog in, that ra in this race. I, I totally get that. Um, but bringing the perspective of a, of a combat veteran to this campaign, um, someone who's ready to take on Donald Trump, it won't be the toughest thing I've done in my life. And I'd be proud to be the next president of the United States. So thanks so much for having me on. And anything, anything can happen because... 
five years ago, the Republicans were saying, oh, I would never vote for Donald Trump. So anything can happen. That's right. That's, That's right. right. All right, Congressman. All right, have a nice again, day. Thank Take you care. for your service, Congressman. Thank you. All right, Congressman Seth Moulton from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, thank you so Ooh. much. Some heavy stuff going on in the morning show today. Absolutely. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, all right, wonderful. That guy was great. Right. Just from what I heard. Yeah, obviously, I was a little surprised and you can't about the pushback he was getting from the Democratic Party. That's happening, Daryl. It's but happening all the time. This it's is happening in Manchester. Well, this is see to me the only way you can get things done, and you, and, and this is my opinion, uh, and not the opinion of anybody else. This is my opinion. You need that middle of the road guy. You need someone that can can you know fight for what he believes in, but reach across the aisle to get things done. A middle grounder. But that's why the Democratic Party was so against him to start. Right. Because if you don't vote the Very, way that they want you to vote, then you're screwed. And right. then you lose the support. I saw it happen in Manchester with someone that I know who voted and went a different way than the Democratic Party wanted him to go. Right. And he got screwed for that by the Democrats here in Manchester. So it it, it's going on everywhere. It happens all over the place. And, and that's why the middle guy can't make it, Peter. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, the lot, I think the last one of the last presidents that was was really good about reaching and you could say what you want about William Jefferson Clinton, but he was he was one president that got things done by by compromising with with, with the other party and getting stuff done. Not a lot of that going on. There's there's nothing. You're either you're either so far right or you're so far left. You they can't you, find you exactly. You need that's exactly that they that's what's happening. And and yeah, you got to find the middle. And then, you know, because this is the worst divide I've ever seen in this country in my lifetime. Most definitely. You know, whether it be social media, we talk about social media a lot. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's crazy. And I try not to, you know, I get frustrated. So I sometimes I do not pay attention to the, you know, I'm not watching uh, Fox News or CNN. Because a lot of people think like, oh, okay, CNN sucks. They're, 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 they're so left. Fox is so far right. These aren't even news stations. These are news commentary stations. Okay, Fox News, CNN, it, it, it's for entertainment, you know what I mean? Unless there's something really, really big news goes down, both both stations are going to cover it. Right. You know, both, yeah. both, both like, like, you know, whether it be 9-11 or whether it be, you know, what happened. What <laughs> the happened, two shootings that what happened, happened this in, weekend? In, in, I mean, in Dayton, they're both with 20-year-old kids going out there? But when there's not, when, when there's not any, any news going on, you know, they're not playing news. They're playing news commentary. Opinion, and that's, and opinion. it's opinionated. And that's all it is. They're not there for that. Right. I'm all fired up. But that's right. And it's great to see. And that's Daryl, too. And it is. Us people who are common, we all have to get together and we got to do something. But it takes time and effort. It takes time and effort. It, it, it's happening in our backyard, guys. You it, know, you think right. this is like, oh, my God. <laughs> You know, it's happening every day, Daryl. Not every day, but it's happening a lot with the Democrats and the Republicans. August 13th last year was when we got kicked out of the school district. That was vote strictly down party lines. That was party lines. Right. And it's, I, I, I to That's me. That's what it was. You know what? If you're going to be a politician in this city and whether you're, whether you're, a, and I'm talking about right here in Manchester, whether you're going to be on the school board, whether you're going to be running for alderman or whatever, you know, be your own person. You know what I mean? Like, like go, go with your gut. Don't go because, you know, your party's telling you to do this. Go with what you believe in. That's who I want in office. Right. They get persecuted for that and they get thrown out of office. Right. By the Republicans or the Democrats. Right. It's fear. And we have a lot of great aldermen here in the city. We have a lot of great people on the school board, you know, and, 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 and I appreciate They're them all, all good people, right. obviously. Right. Like, you, you think they're good people. Right. But, I mean, you know what? You, you think... You know, believe what you believe in. If if, if your party is telling you like to do this, and you're really in your head, you're not too sure. Well, go with your head, and that's what's happening here. I don't know. I got to calm down. We got Nick Lavalley calling uh, in just a minute. We'll be right back. You're listening to Peter White. Call us at two five zero six double zero seven. It's the morning show. It's morning in Manchester on WMNH. Good morning, Peter. Oh, good morning. All right, everyone, we are back here. The morning show continues on this hump day. Wow, we're waiting on Nick LaValley to give us a buzz to talk about his great event coming up uh, 
On Friday at the Alpine Club, tickets are still available. We're going to be talking about that. Wow, what a morning, guys. It's great to see you fired up. I'm sorry to go right back to that, but that's, that's what right. we need to be doing. I get fired up. I, I mean, I'm watching these these Ken Burns documentaries, Vietnam, Civil War. I mean, the Civil War, 600,000 people died. 600,000 people died in the Civil War. And are we any better than, I? Get, well, obviously we are, but are we where we should be? Are we where were those people who risked their lives right. wanted us to be? No, I agree. And, and, and times change. Like you said, we talked about it. Everything is so divided. You can you could say something, you know, you, you see it online all the time. You know, you have, you have your uh, Trumpsters that'll try to shut you down no matter what you say. You know? Yeah. You, you do. There's Democrats like that, though, too. Of course. Of course there is. Well, listen, we're going we're gonna to try to move on. We're fired up. I bet Nick Lavalley's fired up. We'll uh, talk to him. Good morning, Nick. You're on the air. Good morning, Peter. How are you? Good morning. We're all fired up uh, this morning, Nick. Why is everyone fired up this morning? Oh, we just talked. Congressman to- Moulton got us really <laughs> going today. We, we had our first presidential <laughs> candidate uh, on the show this morning. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, you got to cover it all, but he's a, a Democrat uh, candidate for president, uh, Congressman uh, Seth Moulton uh, from Massachusetts. Okay, which- well, that's that's a little bit better then. Yeah, no, it sounded, uh, you know, it sounded like a good guy. And what I try to do here on the show, and this goes for local politicians too, I mean, I like to show the person, the personality, right. the person, instead of, you know sure. what I mean? And, 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 then, and then talk about the issues because... Sometimes you'll look at a politician and you'll you'll say, okay, this is just your typical politician. But when you can when you can be a politician and come off like a like a real human being and 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 be human, you know, I I, I don't know. There's something to be said about that. But all right, I'm calm. Well, well I I'm calm. I now. haven't. I I don't know if I've ever I've ever met a, a human politician. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you may, Nick. You may. And we might. We might. Did know. I just get pulled? I'm not. Look, I don't want it. I don't like getting political. No, I know. I'm all about fun. No, so I, if I can take that energy of you guys getting fired up and turn it into fun, let's do it. Yeah, no, we're not. We're, we're just, you know, we're just excited this morning. That's all. So, okay, good. Let's talk about the Alpine Club in the big event on Friday. Friday night is going to be a blast. We have uh, it's called Laugh for Life. We're doing a benefit show for Bridget's house. Bridget's House is a nonprofit organization that's serving this really people in New Hampshire. Um, it's victim. It, they're built, looking to build a home for victims of uh, trafficking and uh, other uh, forms of sexual abuse. We're Unbelievable! Doing, that sounds heavy. That sounds heavy. But this is a this is going to be a real fun night of stand up comedy. Myself, Trisha Ould, an amazing Boston comedian. And are going to be performing, and obviously it's going to be headlined by Drew Dunn. Drew Dunn, a New Hampshire comic who just, really this is his homecoming because he just performed at the prestigious Just for Laughs Festival in Montreal. He performed for thousands of people. It's, it's always a career, sometimes a career-defining moment for a comedian, and it was pretty amazing that Drew uh, was selected to perform. And uh, this is his first show in New Hampshire, um since he did that last week so oh wow okay uh, tickets are thirty dollars you could get them online if you go to the other com, which is my website there's a ticket link there or if you look up laugh for life on facebook there's a facebook page we'd love to see people come out peter i'm hoping you come out i i do have a i do have a free evening so yeah. you, you you may see me it's a great That'd cause awesome. and uh it sounds like a ton of fun the alpine club's always good you know, you can be who you are there. That's for sure. Oh yeah, right. That's what. <laughs> that's like a. It's a. It's really a Manchester staple. I mean, how many social clubs are there? And 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 the, the, that's one of few that. The, and this is. I got to say, this is a public event. Obviously, this is not just for members of the Alpine Club. Right. And uh, it's a public event. Anyone's invited. You know, I would say definitely over eighteen. You know, keep the kids at home. Make this a night out. Right. Right. I think I, you know. It, it, I think it's really great. I I love watching you perform. Yeah, I I love to see. You. I mean, I, and and uh, it's it's going to be good. We do have a special guest stopping by as well, um, and uh, it's it's going to be a, a really fun night. And uh, you know, uh, 
I, I, I think you should come down, Peter. Okay. Okay. Well, we will talk. We will talk. But uh, I, I will. Well, you want to go, Matt? Yeah, I think we should go. <laughs> Nick, right. I get a quick you question. Go to, you want actually want to go together? Yeah, well, I get to ask my other boss, my other. Okay. I'm interning <laughs> for a lady, too. So. Okay. Okay. Um, Nick. I'm having trouble, right? I just got the Netflix, so I'm on Netflix. I'm, I'm looking. There's so many comedy um, specials on there. I, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm not finding comedians as funny as I guess I used to. Like, um, I guess for an example, back in the early 2000s, a, a, a show that I watched over and over again was the original Kings of Comedy um, that I thought was hilarious, but these I don't know. Maybe I'm just not with the times or whatever. I, I what I'm saying is I'm finding a it's it's hard for me to find a comedian that I can really you're latch trying, on you're, to. You're not finding a comedian with sen- sensibilities that you normally uh, would, would would gravitate to. So, I mean, truly, the best way to, there are some great specials on Netflix. If you, if you wanna if you wanna get an idea or find a stand up a newer stand up, I would start at Netflix series called the stand-ups because then you're watching comedians do 15 minute sets yeah so that and there's i think six per six per season and there's some great comics in there and they, and that way you're only committing to 15 minutes right and, and then from there you can find longer specials by those comedians and let me I, ask I you think, let me ask you though nick as a as a comedian and in, and in, in, you know i know you're not speaking for all comedians but i can tell you 15 minutes on stage doesn't it's feel time. it's a long time correct that's a that's a long time absolutely so if you if you're trying to get invested in a 45 minute 60 minute special for a comedian that you don't know at all that's asking a lot so i would suggest starting at the stand-ups and going through those episodes you'll find people there's great comedians emma wilman's one sam J, taylor tomlinson these are that way you're only you're watching for 15 minutes if you like it great otherwise you only spent 15 minutes watching it the other thing is is that comedy i think is best watched live and really you know it, it truly it, it i think it's amazing when people say i love stand up comedy and i say when was the last time you went to a comedy show and they said oh uh i don't know like 7 years ago i saw seinfeld it's like at a theater it's like right. that's how do you love comedy if you only go to one stand-up show in a theater once a decade? The truly the best way to watch comedy is to see it live, and you could you could actually come to the Shaskeen any given Wednesday night. We have an amazing comedy show. We have great comedians come through. Comics on their way up. Let me tell you, uh, for, have a late for, night special. Sorry to interrupt, Nick, but for example, I was just going to mention the comedy uh, comedy night at the Shaskeen because when you go see these guys live, we Nick brought in. Uh, uh, Shane Torres last year on a Thursday morning after performing at Comedy Night to Shaskeen, and Shane was just on the Stephen Colbert show just the other night. Yeah, so, didn't, you, didn't you have something on Facebook too? Like of another was that Shane? That, that was Shane. That was Shane. And and Nick it's Shane. Yep. The summer before that, who was the other guy? I can't think of it right now. Uh, we had Sam. We brought in Sam Talent, and Sam Talent not only was he on the morning show, and he's a nationally touring comic. He has a book being published this fall. A, a major uh, book uh, publisher is putting out his his uh, his book about stand up, and he also just performed at the Just for Laughs festival. So, uh, you know, we're bringing in comedians that are really out there doing it and really making a name for themselves and and, and getting those late night specials and, and or late night TV spots and and these fifteen minute Netflix shows. So. I I say if you're looking to find a comedian that you can relate to or you know it, it seems to be in your sense of, feel your sensibilities go see comedy go see live comedy come to the shaft yeah we you're right and I am. come to laugh for life on Friday night enjoy yourself you really want to be in it you want to feel like you're you're part you want to be in the room at a live comedy I'm just show. nervous because now I'm watching Jerry Seinfeld's comedies and cough getting coffee or whatever yeah i don't even know if i like jerry seinfeld anymore i don't even know if he's funny anymore no oh, you mean uh co- coffee and cars with millionaires is that what yeah you're right about? exactly <laughs> exactly yeah that's, yeah that's that's come on that's not really i'm starting to think it was there larry david i will say there, i will say though i did i i did watch the one with ricky gervais where they're yeah. in, they're in there getting coffee and none of them they had they didn't have their m- wallet with them or something like that and ricky gervais talks turns around and tells the lady, oh, I'm sorry, 
I don't, we don't have, I don't have any money. I left it in the Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it was kind of funny, but I, uh, I, I, I've been to the uh, comedy night, the Shaskine a few times. It is really, really, really a good time. There's, n- there's never an off night. There is never, it, it is, it is totally energized. Um, no, you've done a great job with that, Nick. That's, that's, you know, you're, you're obviously passionate about the comedy and you've, you're the guy who kind of took that by the, by the horns, right? Absolutely, yeah. We've been doing it now for six years. Myself and my friend Dave Carter, we produce a, a stellar show every Wednesday, and that's one of the reasons why we were um, why I was asked to do the produce this Laugh for Life show on Friday is because of the success of Shasky and Comedy. You know, I'll get people uh, people will message me and ask, "Will you know, will you do this benefit show, or can you produce a show?" And usually, I have to politely say no because you know I'm out there on weekends doing my own shows. But to align myself with a charity um, to, to produce a show, you know, it really had to mean something to me, and I really thought this was a good cause for Bridget's house. And I knew one of the per, uh, people on the board, and I said, you know what, let's do it. And I, uh, I, I'm really hoping people come out, and uh, it's gonna be a, it's going to be a great time. It is it's keep building. an amazing show. And the other thing, too, is, look, when Drew Dunn is on TV, Later this year, inevitably gets on television for something, whether he has a late night spot or he gets a special of his own. Wouldn't you want to say, oh, yeah, I saw that dude at the Alpine Club. <laughs> right. Exa- <laughs> you know, exactly. So, I'm you know, looking at his uh, watch- I'm looking at his headshot right now. It's staring right at me. Oh, yeah, we got it right up here. Well, I, I, mean, I got your poster up here right up right up in front of me, Nick. Careful, guys. If you stare into Drew's eyes or mine, you might fall in love. And uh, yeah, I don't we all know whatever we, you have going on in your house. We all know you have beautiful eyes, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So, okay, you got comedy night uh, at the Shaskeen tonight. Who's being? Who's on there tonight? Tonight, Kristen Christine Blinn is a comic from Western Mass. She's open for Nikki Glazier. She's uh, regularly performs at the uh, the 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 Roar Comedy Club at the new MGM Grand in, in Springfield. She's an amazing, again, an amazing comic, and tonight's show is free. Like, how, how do you do that? That's amazing. You do that, you do that because you want to, I'm trying to give back to the city I grew up in every week by inserting culture into the community, and that's what the Shasking Comedy Show is all about. Come down tonight, come on Friday, uh, you, these are these are two fantastic comedy shows happening right here in the Queen City. You know, people are always saying, "Oh, there's nothing to do." You know, it's like, yeah, there is. You got to find it, and and these things do exist. And it's a great date night. Let me comedy ha- night. At the Shask- a comedy show is a great date night. Now, let me explain why. If you want to get to know a person, go to a comedy show, especially when there's three comics on the bill. See what the you get to see what that other person laughs at. What That's better true. way to get to know a person through their sense of humor? Right. Oh, I I agree, man. I, I I totally agree. I recommend it to everybody. I think it's one of the uh, and, and it's on Wednesday night. What a, what a great way to break uh break up the week, you know. I like to take my Absolutely. dates to Clough State Park. That's why you're isolated yeah. and they can't go anywhere. <laughs> <Right>. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's going to end up uh, one of these uh, uh, murder uh, podcasts or something. Right. right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> guilty. You should see my license. Now, guilty. Now, Nick, you, you, you've done you've, you've done so much uh, for comedy, and and you're voted uh, in the hippo uh, poll, best of poll for many years as uh, best New Hampshire uh, comedian. And you've been on the cover. You know, that's really that's the one thing I think I have above Drew Dunn right now. <laughs> right. Well, well see, I, I have a I have a question for you because on my bucket list, I'd love to get on the cover of that hippo. You've been on twice now, just once. I've been on once. Okay. Now, now how, how how do I go about that? It's his uh, genre. You got to go know. radio, I, I think, right? He's doing comedy. The whole thing on comedy. Sorry I think to interrupt. You have to go from being a really great radio host to uh, an okay stand-up comedian and embarrass yourself right. uh, several times a week. I think that's how I got on. Okay. Okay, that's fair enough. I can do that. <laughs> yeah. All right, Nick. You should listen. get on there. You yeah. start a campaign. Peter Peter White on the hippo. I, I, you know, j- just once. I don't even care if they do an article or anything. I just, I just well, want to... I think your genre is talk about the radio and the well, morning yeah, show man, and how it's course. grown. Like, that's how you get on the cover. 
Of course, of course. Well, well, you also have all these politicians, and I mean, you know, politicians tend to make promises. They they don't necessarily always keep them, but why not see if some of these politicians can start saying, you know what, Peter, if you vote for me, I'll get you on the cover of the hippo. Okay, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then I don't really have to vote for him, so I can say I did. No, <laughs> no, actually, you don't have to vote at all. So. Right, very good. Well, Nick, uh, I hope to see you Friday night, and uh, uh, you, you know, you know, personally, I love you. Yeah, love you too. And I love what you do for the city, Peter. Thank you for having me on, and I hope everyone has a good day. And make sure you hit up theotherdude.com to buy your tickets for Laugh for Life or visit us on Facebook. Just type in Laugh for Life. Okay, Nick. Well, listen, you have a wonderful day, and we will talk to you real soon. Take care, Peter. All right. Nick LaValle, everybody. Wow. Again, another What question. a show. Right. This summer has really been uh, booming. It really has. It, it, it's been a <laughs> lot of fun. But Dar- and Daryl's back three times a week almost. So uh, almost. I, I'm going to say I'm going to say you'll probably. When do you think you'll fully be beco- uh, recovered, Daryl? By by October. October. Right. You th- October first is your day. Probably. It could be sooner. Right. Uh, I'll know more tomorrow after my appointment. Okay. I'm getting more range of motion in my arm, so that's the key. And right. The more I can do with my arm. Uh, and uh, tomorrow's appointment should be very interesting. Right. And I think your Uber driver is here also. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ben Dion is here. So Thank you, Ben. How's it going? Ben, how you doing? Oh, uh, you know, just here, here to pick up Dad. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, th- this will end soon. Uh, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> right. I'm and, getting a little tired of picking him up over well, here. Well, and, 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 and all joking aside. It's your I summer mean, internship. Let it, me ask it you. really though, is. All joking aside, you would do anything for this guy. Uh, almost anything. Except shower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's something I didn't even want to go near. You know, that's too disturbing, you know. What, do you just put a bag over, or are you just, like, kind of bathing yourself, or? Oh, no, no you want to find my brother from another mother. Oh, jeez. His best friend is coming over to shower him. Three oh, days okay. a week. Three days a week. No kidding? And that's no. okay. That's awesome. But, but I think that is awesome. But Daryl does the waste below like he doesn't get in there and <laughs> yeah. he doesn't yeah. he doesn't let's just say dick dryer doesn't get into the nooks and crannies of daryl dion <laughs> that's, a, that's another show no, right. no 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 right amazing so wow what a show today <laughs> hilarious so what are you guys doing you just dropping them off or no we're uh we're gonna go out to breakfast he needs to do a little shopping so we'll we'll go to bed bath and beyond bed bath and beyond <laughs> you're yes. going do you remember when it was just called bed and bath yeah and it used to be over in the Bedford Mall. Yeah, when did they add the Beyond part? Uh, sometime in the, after the, the year 2000, I okay. think. Well, I know they have toys there. Every stinking store now has toys. Yeah. Right. And they you got to deal with that with your beyond. kid. And they're they by the register, toys too. In really? Bed Bath & Beyond. Yep. Or no, hold on. Maybe I'm wrong. No, you're right. <sighs> there's they, a whole toy section? A, there's like a little, like, as seen on TV, and then there's like these little trinkets and toys right they by sell the register. Too. Right. Yeah. That's where they get the Beyond part. Yeah, yeah, right. I, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's more of like a home goods now, right? Bed Bath & Beyond is more of like a, a home goods type store. Yeah, I think Absolutely. home goods is actually the one I was thinking about that has toys. But see, if you want to... Thank you for they, backing see, me. They, 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 they also too, have though. a toy section over at Dollar Tree. Yep. It's not too exciting, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> for a four-year-old kid, it is. Trust me. Yeah. And then they get excited because you buy them, like, say you buy them, like, five different things. Yep. Right. And, and you only spend $5. That's right. Except you have to deal with the smell of the dollar store. There's a certain smell <laughs> a to a dollar. Really? Like, yeah, you know, you know, when you walk into a place and you're like, hey, you, you know, like Mammoth Mills. Yeah, like Mammoth Mills was oh, like yeah. that. Building yeah. 19 Building was 19. like that. Oh, for sure, Building 19. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that odor. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you could almost smell it from outside the store. It's like funk. Zyla's had that too. Yeah, Zyla's yeah. Just well. a, yeah. I don't know if it's a dirty kind of kind of smell, uh, but it's an I don't aroma. Know about dirty, but it's funk. Right. Yeah. I like that smell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna bottle it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get down and get funky. Uh, get down and get do funky. I have, do I have time to tell you what we're yes, doing August twentieth? Do. If please you don't do. mind. We've had a busy show today. Yeah, Go ahead. Great Let show. Another great show. Let it but, rip. Um, August twentieth. The I've been doing this long enough now where the first group of cohort kids that I had are now like 24, 23 years old. And uh, there were some shootings and uh, down in Elmwood was one specifically. And a couple of these guys got together and asked me the reason why I'm involved is because we have our 501c3. So they're actually allowed to do it um, to back them on that. And then we got the permits because we're going to be serving food. But they want to go and talk 
to the younger kids about the mistakes that they made, the things that they did right. Um, so we're going to be talking to like six, anywhere from six year olds to sixteen year olds. Um, that we're sounds- doing it from five to eight. So we had to get a permit through the health department. Uh, the guy's name is Aaron. He was great helping me out with that stuff because we're serving food. So you have to have a hand washing oh, station sure. now. I mean, you got to do all kinds of things. Where's this being held? In Elmwood Gardens. It's oh, down okay. on um, South, South Elm. Elm. Right. I know but, where it is. And, West, and West. the slogan that they came up with is rise from where you are. And sure. they're going to be talking to these kids about the, the decisions to be making and it just once again validates what I've been doing, and I'm not crazy. And the mentee is becoming the mentor, and that's really what you want. And that's the, the real sign of a successful program. Is sure, these guys are coming and giving back too. I know a lot and, of, and uh, I know a lot of guys that are my age, and uh, they become very successful. But it, it, and they come from the Elmwood Housing Projects, yeah. as they used to be called. Yeah. Um, you know, all you know. There's some aldermen out there that are that are. Bill are, Barry, well, Bill Barry is our keynote speaker, of course. Of course, he is. That's great. Well, yeah, you, but see, what, that's the thing. Like, well, I you br- couldn't get John Clayton. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, Bill is right. So I've been doing this long enough. Again, to, where people come in, yeah. like you guys, yeah, right, and you know who you can leave them alone with and who you can't. Like that, they'll get tore up. You two were those guys. Bill Barry is another one where I just left them, and he had them. He had those kids. He was in control. And it's because he can relate to them, right? right? What's the first thing he says to them? I remember waiting for Tuesdays to get the meatloaf, right. you know, or whatever. And they relate to that. And yep. and there he is talking about giving back. And he got into it because he want you know, helping, coaching. He wanted to coach every sport that he played, you yep. know, and had people doing that. And he did that. So, I mean, you know. He's obviously a little bit older, but he gives us the credibility with the politics and stuff like that. And hearing sure. it from him is great. But the the real thing is these the impact is going to be these twenty to twenty five year olds telling these kids, "Listen, do this, do that. These are what I learned from." But with that said, we all know you got to experience yourself. You can have a million people telling you what to do. Right. It comes down to you and you doing it. And it's about inspiring, motivating, getting them to believe in education, build your foundation get a job, do it the right way. I mean, these are all things that they see sometimes, but they don't see sometimes. And, and it's a very confusing time. And it's where we, we don't want to lose them because they're going a different direction. And, you know, some of this stuff that's happening, you know, 14 to 18 year olds, you know, they're not adults. Right. And uh, we just got to get them on the right track. You know, that commercial that we play with Manchester Proud. Sure. You know, and I think it's Mayor Gassis who says, you know, our public education is directly related with the success of our city. Well, right now, our education is not where it's supposed to be, whether you talk about the teacher's contracts with Peter Perrick, which was a great example that I wasn't even thinking of. And then you go and you look, we are losing our best teachers. Mm -hmm. We're losing too many teachers. And and that's something that more people have to be saying. And you can go to Merrimack and make 15 grand more immediately. We got to address those. We got to take care of that stuff. Well, also, you know, People will leave a city because of school districts. Correct. And Correct. Like, and people have gone out to Bedford, or right. kids are going out to uh, uh, Pinkerton. Correct. Uh, you know, it, it, it. You know, the the goal is, let's keep them here. You know. Right. And that's that whole thing. Like, if if you think about Ben, what are we telling our best basketball players now to do? AAU. Get the heck out of here. Yeah. Don't go win a state championship for Memorial. Get the heck out of here. Go to prep school. Correct. Yeah, wow. we got to stop that because I'm telling you right now, this garbage about you need to go to AAU to get a scholarship and stuff is completely false. Mm-hmm. And it's even more false if you ask me with women's basketball, and I have experience with that where I've seen kids go to different places and they could have easily got that same scholarship if they stuck by their school. Yep. And that's where we're losing our pride in our schools because – our athletics. Look at our athletics I in Manchester. Know, can I say something? Yes. My idea, and I've said it before on this show. Okay. Uh, what, what, Bed- Bedford High School state champs. Football, right? Right. Okay. Not too many. Like, when I was in school, we, there were state championships going around all over the place. You, and you can go to any of these schools' gymnasiums and see right. what Absolutely. they've done, whether it be track, tennis, football, basketball, whatever. And with all these, you know, Bedford opening up a school, we lost all those students going out to going out to Bedford, and now the hooks of kids have a choice to see which school right, they go right. to, yep. um, and most of them are going to Pinkerton. Mm-hmm. Um, my whole thing, okay, you have Central West, you have Memorial, okay, always been a rivalry here in our our uh, humble small city or whatever, right? 
it doesn't work anymore. Sports, uh, there's other, there's kids, you know, going to AAU or doing these different other programs. What I say to become a force in sports in this city, all those schools, Central West Memorial, were all technically all Manchester High School. There's Manchester High School Memorial, Manchester High School Central, Manchester High School West. Why not combine that, have a Manchester High School sports team, the football team? You know what I mean? You're going to have the best players. Okay, right? I mean, is this, this is just my idea. But I, I think I that, mean, you're obviously going to get the most talent. Ben, you're going to the charter commission. What, can we do this? Can we do this? I, I think you can do it with some sports because right. they don't have enough people. Right. But, right, because you have like the hockey team where right. you have two schools already a combined hockey team. But other sports like football, like basketball, um, baseball. baseball probably too, there's a lot of kids already trying out. So I, I wouldn't really work there just because, I mean, the talent's gone down, but some of it's just because the talent's gone down. Like, Okay. Some of the sports, I know with basketball in the last few years, any of those teams from Memorial that that played in the last probably like five years that played a team when I was going to high school, we right. would have demolished. Right. And we used to get demolished. And you went to Memorial? Yeah. Who are you demolishing? <laughs> <laughs> These kids, we would have. But the, but it, to me, like it's just the overall talent level. Because if you put one of our teams from when I played, right. now we win every state championship. Well, you know, I'm a central guy. That's why I made that it's memorial. Okay. No, that's why I made the that. The best kids aren't no playing, perfect, though, Peter. because right. they're not getting the grades that they need to be right. doing. Like, that's yeah. happening. They're going to prep school. Yep. And I don't know. I I, I don't know. I, I think the talent level is still there. We just don't know where the heck it is, and right. we can't find it. No, I agree, yeah. I can tell you right now, one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life happened four years ago, and it's Trayvon Mon up in, up in Durham, mm-hmm. and he absolutely dominated it was it was the best performance I've ever seen live. Right, and I've been going to those things for a long time, and it, it just there's no pride, there's well, no pride, and you know it's it's leave the city. That is our answer now. That's what right. we're telling our kids: get out. That's your best chance. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you right now, if we're doing commercials for Manchester Proud and saying our schools are, you know, public education is collectively uh, directly connected to our success of our community, well, we got a lot of work to do, and let's get rolling. All right, all right. Well, listen, we got to say goodbye to everyone in our Facebook Live room this morning as we 